Today's segment is sponsored by the MIC Institute of Technology, Training for Industry, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and Trico Clinic, Hair and Scalp Solutions. Good morning and welcome to the National Training Agency's first virtual convention, the Technical and Vocational Education and Training TVET e convention. I'm Sunita Ganthat, Manager of Business Development and Communications at the National Training Agency, and today I will take you through this morning's proceedings. As we begin our official opening, I wish to introduce someone with over 30 years' experience in TVET at both the secondary and tertiary levels. She has published several articles in the CXC magazine and presented webinars under UNESCO Uni Univoc. She's also the chairman of the Caribbean Association of National Training Authorities, CANTA, and the chief executive officer acting at the National Training Agency. Welcome, Ms. Pauline Whiteman. Thank you for that introduction. And good morning to all our valued stakeholders. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the National Training Agency's Technical and Vocational Education and Training e-Convention 2020. This is the agency's second TVET convention, but its first e-convention. Over the past few months, we have all been affected by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the way we work and live our daily lives. Some persons have been more severely affected than others and have lost their loved ones and sources of income as a result of this crisis. It is not only a time for us to examine what we do, but how we do things in order to overcome the obstacles before us. Despite the challenges, the NTA decided that it was imperative to host this forum for all our valued stakeholders, local, regional, at the local, regional, and international level. In this regard, this year, we chose to host our TVET convention virtually in light of current restrictions in a space where everyone would be comfortable and safe in keeping with the new normal. The theme for our TVET e-convention is Unleashing the Potential, Transforming Technical and Vocational Education and Training and the targets key stakeholders from various sectors, industries, and areas across Trinidad and Tobago. The topics which will be discussed are virtual and augmented training for TVET, namely the role of online training in skills development, and innovations in ICT and its effect on the quality of TVET delivery and learning. New modes of training in the workplace post COVID-19, including apprenticeship systems and innovative practices, as well as entrepreneurship, where successful entrepreneurs in TVET will be highlighted along with a focus on digital entrepreneurship. This e-convention is expected to promote TVET as a viable mechanism for workforce development while strengthening 
our relations with all of you, our stakeholders. It is the hope that it will also provide platforms to address the changes in the current TVET landscape while determining how best the NTA can assist and respond effectively and efficiently during this transition period. As we continue moving ahead in an uncertain future, particularly where the future of work is always evolving, our motto, preparing tomorrow's workforce today, is even more pertinent. The NTA remains resolute in continuing to execute its mandate in support of workforce development and navigating this crisis successfully. Our panel of presenters represents a diverse cross-section of youth, knowledge, expertise, and the entrepreneurial spirit. So the next three days will definitely prove to be productive and beneficial for all of us and the organizations we represent. A recurring theme throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is we are all in this together. It is a reminder that while all of us may not necessarily be experiencing the same struggles, we are often faced with similar circumstances as others, allowing us to engage in deep introspection and find a greater sense of empathy within us. Through this convention, we can continue to support each other while coming up with new ideas and solutions, which will chart the way forward in the best interest of all concerned. I therefore encourage everyone to join us. Listen to the presentations and ask questions. Also, share your comments and your feedback, as this will be useful and helpful for all of us. It is through the feedback from and collaboration with you, our stakeholders, that we can become more responsive to your needs and also inform you of the trends and the changes within Tibet. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude this morning, I wish to thank you for being a part of our Tibet convention. Stay safe and God bless. Thank you, Ms. Whiteman, for those wonderful remarks. Now I would like to invite an individual with extensive experience in training and education, with particular interest in tertiary education, administration and management, quality assurance and accreditation. She's currently the Deputy Chairman of the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago, ACTT, as well as the VP for Quality Assurance, Institution Effectiveness at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, UTT. Please welcome our Chairman of the National Training Agency, Dr. Ruby Allen. Thank you, Ms. Jan Pat. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the National Training Agency, I warmly welcome you to this year's e-convention. When we gathered at the Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain in 2018 to host our inaugural TBED convention, none of us would have anticipated that our second convention would have been held under these circumstances. We had indicated then that it was our intention to make the Tibet Convention an annual forum at which to discuss national and regional issues in the sector, as well as new and emerging developments and global trends. Subsequently, in order to support a regional TVET initiative and to allow for networking with our Caribbean counterparts, the Board of Directors decided on a biennial event, with the next one earmarked for June 2020. This was before the pandemic. But today, we find ourselves in the midst of a global crisis, and no country in the world has been spared. 
health systems and economies the world over have been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Here at home and abroad, education and training institutions have been forced into emergency remote teaching as their doors have been closed and will in many cases remain shut for several months. Already experts are predicting that as labor markets struggle to adjust to the new economic imperatives, skills development will be a major part of the policy response <clears throat> to massive job losses in many countries so that displaced workers can be reoriented towards employment or entrepreneurship. <clears throat> Trinidad and Tobago, through its astute handling of the pandemic at the national level, has mitigated some of the serious social and economic consequences with which countries which were less prepared or less judicious in their actions are faced. And for this, we are thankful. It is as a result of this that we are able, one month later than originally planned, to host this e-convention bringing policymakers, leading TVET practitioners and educators, and a very diverse group of stakeholders to the virtual table to share insights and engage in meaningful dialogue on the role of TVET now and in the future. While the pandemic has brought with it many challenges, we must also acknowledge that it will accelerate the pace of the development of the movement towards the digitization of the workplace and automation of business processes, particularly in the developing world. Additionally, the world is witnessing the closure of many businesses and the birth of others driven by the demand for services and products deemed to be essential for very survival. In this environment, innovative approaches have emerged new product lines have opened up and this has implications for the demand for skills. In the midst of uncertainty, it is difficult to predict what the future holds. However, it is clear to us at the NTA that even as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose a major threat to all of us, it has been a stimulus for major shifts in the demand for skills. And it is this impact on the labor markets worldwide to which TVET systems must respond. What then has the NTA been doing over the past two years since our last convention? And how have these initiatives positioned us for the responsibilities which lie ahead? As chair of the board, let me take just a few moments to account briefly for our stewardship. We are well into the implementation of a new strategic plan, and one of our major developments has been the international recognition that the NTA has earned by being accepted by UNESCO as a UNESCO Univox Center, the first in Trinidad and Tobago dedicated to strengthening TVET and expanding access to underserved communities, and particularly youth not in employment, education, or training. At the international level, we have also partnered with Prince's Trust International through the kind assistance of the British High Commission to support the development and implementation of the ACHIEVE program in secondary schools on both islands. This program seeks to give young people a sense of personal well-being and to develop in them the mental and social readiness to learn and to work, which are vital to their success. Then at the regional level, the NTA in Trinidad and Tobago was recently recommended by the CARICOM Secretariat to participate in a pilot project for the implementation of the UNESCO Qualifications Passport in this part of the world. And we have initiated discussion with the Ministry of Education on our possible involvement. Finally, at the national level, we have produced a TVET policy paper to address macro issues such as the rationalization of the sector, 
developed a blueprint for the establishment of a TVET Research Council. And we've also developed a new national apprenticeship system, which we hope will be launched next year, offering second chances to out-of-school youth with a desire to acquire skills and lead productive lives. During this convention, we will also launch a new and exciting product which is the first of its kind among NTAs in this part of the world, and which will change how we view transcripts or student records. The record of achievement, which we will launch, will tell prospective employers what graduates can do and not just what subjects they studied. And so we have formed a strategic alliance with the Human Resources Management Association of Trinidad and Tobago to explain the value of this development to you and to those who will benefit from its introduction. We have done all of this while also taking resolute steps towards capacity building and strengthening the NTA's policies and processes to deliver on its mandate of improving the quality, relevance, and efficiency of the TVET system in Trinidad and Tobago. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, these are turbulent times and change is inevitable. There are new imperatives which will impel us to respond to changing social realities and the impact of the impending transformation of the global economy. For the NTA and those in technical and vocational education and training, these are also challenging times, but we believe that it is opportunity and not defeat which blows in on the winds of change. Let us seize the opportunity through this convention to engage in dialogue, to learn from each other, and to reflect on how we must adapt to the new realities. And when this convention ends, let us develop a plan of action to implement something of value that we would have gained from the experience. So that at the next convention in 2022, we will have an opportunity to talk about what we did in response to COVID-19 and the difference that it made. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your presence and your contribution and may God bless us all. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for always bringing such positive messages to us. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I wish to introduce the gentleman who is active in the pursuit of engineering education reform and a motivator for change in regional innovative culture. His professional career includes being a joint recipient, along with the GPAN team, of a Chiconian Medal Gold, one of Trinidad and Tobago's highest national awards. Please welcome Professor Brian Copeland, Pro-Vice Pro Chancellor and Campus Principal at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Thank you and, and good morning to all my colleagues. Um, it's felt like the old, good old days. I was chair of NTA for, um, for quite some time, around 2004. Um, so to all colleagues at the NTA, uh, uh, to CEO, to the chairman, the CEO, um, sponsor of the, of the event, the panelists and participants in this webinar um, that's aptly entitled Unleashing the Potential Transforming Technical and Vocational Education and Training. So good morning to all again. I really can't say how happy I am to be here this morning at the formal launch of this Technical and Vocational Education and Training e-convention. I want to address some of the issues that I think will be covered um, at this e-convention, at this webinar, but in a, a very sort of a, a, a general holistic fashion, because I think there are some general directions that we need to focus on to guide our star, to guide our sorry, to, to set a, a guiding star, um, if you like, for all the things that we'll do, all the things we'll discuss here, and all the actions that we will engage in post the convention. I'll start with a bit of history, and it goes as follows. When 
I started my tenure as the St. Augustine campus principal uh, back in 2016. Um, I asked my staff a very, very fundamental question, and that is, what is the real purpose of education? Why are we doing this? And it might seem to be a trivial question. You'll get a trillion different answers at the same time um, if you ask it. But it is one that is important. Um, uh, a question needs to be asked again and again if it is that we have to ensure that we are, we are always on the, the right path. Now, the current COVID environment and the challenges that we faced, even pre COVID, speak to the reality that any nation would, over the course of time, face a spectrum of scenarios. And this will span from the worst possible uh, worst possibility, which I could describe. Of course, there are different descriptions for it, but to me, societal collapse and or societal isolation consequent to a natural or man-made disaster. It sounds as if we are almost pretty close to that, um, that state right now, uh, globally, at least. And the spectrum then goes from this worst possible so a best sort of scenario, however you might define it. And some choose to define it using the strategic development goals of the UN. But I could probably surmise that it would incorporate uh, a society that is thriving very well, that is generally content, but is void of all the ills of modern society. And at the same time, is well prepared for the fallout of a natural disaster. You can't avoid that. If one accepts this as a given, and of course there are whole essays that could be written on this, but if you accept this as a given, then one would come to the inescapable conclusion that our education system, all components of it, the formal, the informal, even the non-formal components, should have as its primary goal the preparation of every citizen to survive in all of these scenarios. I need to make it clear that I'm speaking of survival in the broadest possible sense of the word here. Now, if you think about it, a robust education system that prepares us for these scenarios would ensure that every citizen has effective mastery of body and mind, a mastery that enables them to make optimum use of their physical, mental, and intellectual capabilities, while providing them with the core knowledge and attendant skills required for survival across the spectrum of possible futures. So I claim now that this is where TVET can play a critical role in our national education system. I will attempt in the short term allotted to itemize its key benefits and its potential. First of all, TVET preparation for all citizens, and I stress all citizens, enables them to significantly improve their chance of survival if cut off from society. Further, it enables the society to rebuild itself in the aftermath of a nationwide disaster, such as an earthquake, hurricane devastation, and we're living in the Caribbean, we know exactly what that means. Think of how much easier the task of rebuilding would be if, for example, every home or small business owner is possessed of required skills and competencies, even if it's just to, as they say, fend for themselves. Secondly, TVET wide education for all citizens also provides the wherewithal to make better lives for themselves um, in better times. And as society works towards that best of times scenario. So there's a journey. It's a journey to this best of times scenario that will be characterized by more specialized labor markets worldwide and a concomitant increased demand for higher levels of skill in the technical and vocational areas. That's a given. This need will be accentuated in any reasonably designed post-COVID recovery plan. And indeed, COVID has provided us, as the chair has said, with an opportunity that we should not ignore. For our enforced isolation and self-imposed national quarantine have shown how critical it is to build greater self-reliance and self-sufficiency in our society. Tibet education will play a significant role in the transformation to the innovative entrepreneurial region that many experts have now accepted as a prerequisite to the creation of a sustainable economy. Indeed, this should be a major objective of all other aspects of the national education system. 
that innovation component is significant as it addresses the creation of novel products and processes or the novel improvements to existing products and processes that by virtue of their novelty naturally enhances their competitiveness. In this regard, I must make mention of a UB St. Augustine initiative for economic entre entrepreneurship that targets the growth of a regional SME sector that, like the successful German Mittelstadt, comprises a significantly large number of companies and earns at least 30%, 30% of foreign exchange requirements. Interestingly, the German Mittelstadt employs some 60% of that country's workforce. So this Caribbean Mittelstadt, as I've come to call it, it will epitomize a more democratized economy. It complements a highly siloed economy that is typical across the Caribbean, and which by extension would naturally be much more resilient than what currently obtains. So if you buy all into all of this, it will suggest that we should aggressively work towards a more pervasive implementation of TVET in the national education system. However, the long-standing bias against uh, vocational education poses a major threat in this regard. Our children, their parents, and society at large should recognize that many of the skills most needed to compete in the global markets of the 21st century fall under the TVET umbrella. In a post-COVID world, many of the most valuable skills for a country's survival would also fall into that category. Now, the focus or lack thereof on technical and vocational education and training is not at all new. We have kicked this ball around for decades. However, as we all know, transforming mindsets to achieve the acquired cultural transformation does not easily happen. And this, colleagues, is really a branding issue, one that requires the application of a mix of strategic actions. One way of treating with this, if I am so permitted, to make suggestions is through this expansion of TVET options at secondary school. In fact, we should do all that is necessary to ensure that every secondary school student gains competence in at least one TVET period. And that's a mantra that we sung um, uh, during my time at, at um, NTA, and which sub subsequently um, I know that the NTA has been working on this. But if we do this, over time, it should lead to a broader acceptance and enhanced respect for TVET. And just in case you asked, TVET has made its way into the hallowed halls of the university. The Faculty of Engineering, for example, has been, elaborate, has been collaborating with the NESC since 2009 to offer CDQ training to students in its pre-engineering program. Further, the School of Education and the Faculty of Humanities and Education um, offers a Master of Arts in Education, Leadership in uh, Technical, Vocational, Educational and Training, and Workforce Development. And the prior learning assessment and recognition regime has also found its way into uh, the, the UE discourse. And PLAR, as you, as you know, is a construct that arises primarily out of the, the TVET environment. So we're on the board. And we are moving ahead, but I fear that it's all too slowly, all too slowly. Another suggestion is to create and or strengthen the licensing regime for a wider range of trade disciplines. It already exists in the areas for electricians and plumbers, but licensing should be a mandatory requirement for employment. This will have the benefit of professionalizing the vocations, as well as providing a greater degree of comfort to users of these services. Admittedly, it will also result in an increase in cost of, in cost of services, but you pay for what you get. That's the mantra right now. COVID-19 has given us an opportunity. It has provided the nations of this region with the opportunity to rethink and re-engineer our national education systems. Given that the systems we have evolved, um, but not significantly from what obtained in our colonial past, this re-engineering is long overdue. COVID-19 is giving us the chance to finally get it right. Let us seize the moment. So in closing then, I want to congratulate the National Training Agency 
for the achievements outlined by the chair in her remarks and for hosting this timely e convention. I applaud your goal to apply fresh minds and fresh perspectives so as to emerge with creative solutions for transforming technical and vocational education and training in Tobago. And I welcome our speakers from Canada, CARICOM countries, and from Trinidad and Tobago, who, along with participants, are able to electronically interact and beam their contributions. Technology, when used widely, can indeed be a wonderful thing. So, colleagues, please accept my best wishes for a successful three days of collaboration. Be assured that we at the UB stand ready to support your future endeavors. And with that, colleagues, I thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you, Professor Copeland, for being a part of this significant occasion. So this brings us to the end of the opening of the TVET E Convention. And at this point, I would like to hand you over to our moderator for today's session, the Manager of Research, Planning and Development at the National Training Agency, Dr. Patrice Parasil. Thank you, Sunita. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. As Sunita would have indicated, I am Dr. Patrice Farris Sirs, and I will be serving as your moderator throughout the day. My role is very simple. I will be introducing our esteemed presenters, and at the end of both presentations, I will act as your voice. I therefore invite, I invite you to please include all your comments, your queries onto the chat room. For those of you who are on the GoToWebinar, please insert your questions there. For those of you who are participating on the YouTube channel, please insert your questions. And at the end of both presentations, those questions will be channeled to me and I will deliver them on your behalf. Today's presentations and discussion will focus on the thematic area, virtual and augmented training. And our first presenter is no stranger to these concepts. Having time and time again demonstrated his strong passion for building coalitions with private, public and civil society for the purposes of advancing folks affordable access to both fixed and mobile broadband internet as well as to access digital skills. In his 30 years of career, he has served in senior management positions at various organizations, inclusive of the British Council, Transparency International, the Open Knowledge Network in Asia, and One World International. Currently, he is the Commonwealth of Learning's Advisor on Skills and the Asian Advice Coordinator for the World Wide Web Foundations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bashir Hamad Shadra. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patrice. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, I, I hope I am audible. Yes, we are, Dr. Shadaraka. We are hearing you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, the chairperson, Dr. Ruby Aline, uh, and the CEO for uh, giving the Commonwealth of Learning an opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, August gathering. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be a part of this uh, important uh, seminar that uh, you have embarked upon. Um, 
I'm also thankful to Mr. Stephen Bujavan and Mr. Amrika Maharaj for uh, uh, coordinating this uh, so wonderfully. So uh, it's my pleasure to be with you all. Can you also see my screen? Uh, Yes, we are. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, I, I thought I would start with uh, 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 a film, a one minute film that you would want to watch and uh, I'll proceed with the Good morning, children. Good morning, children. Good morning, teacher boy. Good morning, teacher boy. Oh, two pieces of eggs. Two pieces of eggs. Two pieces of and the best student of the year is Lakshmi Lata. Yeah, this was 10 years ago when uh, we never thought uh, uh, open and distance learning at the school level was possible. This uh, TV commercial by a telco uh, that promoted the broadband access to idea telephone in this case uh, was uh, very clear in terms of how remote schooling was possible, how we could uh, integrate the out of school children into the formal schooling system by way of connecting people with technology is a, is a good uh, testament to what uh, we are witnessing today during the COVID times, that even the mainstream schools are having to undertake the same uh, approach. Before proceeding any further, I am obliged to introduce my organization, the Commonwealth of Learning, which I would like uh, Dr. Aline uh, to be recognized uh, perhaps uh, in the uh, next forum as one of the global partners that uh, you have, uh, global allies that you have uh, by your side. Uh, we are here to serve you. We are serving 54 Commonwealth nations around the world uh, ever since uh, the heads of uh, governments met in Vancouver in 1987 the only organization that uh, widens access to learning and promoting cooperation between uh, formal education systems uh, in terms of uh, providing distance uh, technology enabled and open learning practices. We are committed to the goal number four of uh, the sustainable development uh, goals, uh, where uh, we recognize uh, targets uh, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, and 4B, which relate to largely to the technical and vocational education uh, stream, particularly by providing uh, uh, every adult, uh, every uh, secondary school uh, child to uh, adult uh, with uh, quality skills uh, so that they can uh, excel in their lives uh, so nobody is left behind. As you know, 17 million children in a primary age group are not in school, 16 million lower secondary youth are out of school, and uh, the, the performance is uh, quite stunning uh, in terms of the quality, and particularly at a period when uh, the Commonwealth uh, is a young Commonwealth. A lot of people in the Commonwealth are very young, particularly 60% of the Commonwealth is uh, under 30, of the 2.4 billion people and uh, the youth employment is very high. Now if we look at uh, the Caribbean situation, uh, you know while uh, Caribbean is doing very well at the secondary level, when it comes to the tertiary education, Caribbean is falling behind uh, 
the global average, as you can see. But uh, interestingly, when it comes to the mobile penetration and the internet access in the Caribbean, it's, uh, a f it's it fares much better than the global average. So the, the connectivity is uh, much better. And in this context, uh, as, I, as noted by my earlier speakers, uh, the uh, skills for employability, particularly uh, the soft skills and the leadership skills and the cognitive skills are quite important for the future of jobs. Uh, particularly when it comes to the young people wanting to be integrated into the uh, larger world of uh, labor market. Um, you know, as you can see, it is recognized that the 21st century skills require uh, uh, relationship workers uh, in the three areas of key literacy, human, data, technological, and as I mentioned, uh, soft skills, life skills, and cognitive skills, critical thinking skills, all these are essential in addition to the technical skills that we possess, uh, we gain in our TVET institutions. And keeping this in mind, uh, we have partnered with uh, Coursera to provide uh, 50,000 unemployed citizens, which includes also the students, uh, with free access to 4,000 courses and 400 special specializations. Uh, um, uh, so that they can become employable, they can be uh, employ employment ready, if you like, and also entrepreneurship ready. So I want to open this opportunity to the NTA and to the nation of uh, Trinidad and Tobago for you to take advantage of this opportunity that we are offering. St. Lucia, with a population of 170,000 people, have uh, sent 800 learners to learn on Coursera. Uh, this is completely free. So if uh, NTA would want to take the leadership uh, and uh, anybody at uh, the uh, national agency would want to take the leadership and send uh, even 2,000 uh, or uh, 10,000 of your uh, young people to accessing this free courses on Coursera, which uh, relate to the 21st century employability skills, you are welcome to do so. You have access to uh, this opportunity until the 31st of December. These are short courses that prepare students uh, and uh, the unemployed citizens to gain access to skills. Now, looking at uh, the uh, conference theme, and uh, uh, you know, rightly so, you have identified uh, uh, to unleash the potential of uh, uh, Tibet and transforming the sector itself, uh, the opportunity in the virtual and augmented training workplace uh, training uh, in a post-COVID uh, and also entrepreneurship in Tibet. Uh, you know, I want to speak to uh, some of those uh, issues today. And we recognize that the current status of Tibet uh, globally, uh, the perceptional value is very low. There's a huge market gap between the graduates that come out of uh, our institutions uh, to the labor market. Uh, so there is a, a, a big desire to transform Tibet and technology has come to our aid, uh, and uh, uh, particularly when it comes to the Caribbean, with uh, the, the high connectivity, there is a greater possibility of uh, us to embark upon this journey. Now, we have seen in the recent past, uh, this is uh, Watson Lab of the IBM that provides uh, personalized teaching aids uh, through robots, uh, robots uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, uh, and uh, the machine learning techniques. And uh, we see that uh, there is a, a, a greater possibility today more than before uh, for every uh, person to have a personal tutor with the intelligent support for collaborative learning and group learning. So the teachers become expert facilitators. And this example is from the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Open University of Malaysia has come up with uh, use of chatbots to support uh, uh, students in their in their uh, learning journey. You have uh, interactive and intelligent textbooks uh, programs uh, around the world that are taking taking off uh, in terms of not only giving the annotation opportunities uh, uh, and uh, the search opportunities, but also there is a, a kind of a question answer bank uh, in each and every subject uh, uh, that the stu student is pursuing, uh, so that uh, the 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 entire learning journey is uh, much uh, optimized. Now, when will the post-COVID era commence? Uh, we do not know if uh, 
this current uh, COVID crisis is going to immediately uh, uh, cease to happen. It is predicted that uh, the first vaccine is going to be available only in the early part of 2021, and uh, which nations and within the nations, so which uh, age groups would get the vaccine is uh, unclear. So one should uh, uh, accept the fact that the new normal is going to be uh, here to uh, go, go, going to be the new normal for at least for the next two years. But in the next two years, uh, we will see a lot of changes in the system. And uh, as uh, Milton Friedman mentioned, only a crisis actually or perceived produces a real change. And when the crisis occurs, the action taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And there are many ideas, as you know, that are lying around, including what we are discussing today in terms of augmented and uh, virtual reality opportunities in Tibet. In uh, 536 AD, when the first uh, volcanic eruption happened and uh, what they describe as the dark world, the temperature uh, became very cold, coldest in fact in the last 2000 years, 100 million people died, resulting in uh, the end of the Roman Empire uh, 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 all, and a famine all the way from uh, Ireland to China. We also witnessed in 19, uh, the, the 1349 what they call the Black Death, when uh, uh, off of uh, England population was wiped, wiped off, when the, when the pandemic uh, uh, resumed in 1361, another 20% died off, ending in uh, England and Fr France uh, century-long war. In 1981, many of us are aware of uh, the so-called Spanish flu, although it never started from Spain, uh, resulted in 50 million deaths, uh, one third of the same in India. And uh, we need to now look at uh, what COVID is going to do. But um, as uh, the earlier speakers mentioned, it's an opportunity to commence a new way of living, working, traveling, extending our responsibility to one another, but also introduce uh, virtual education, as they say. And, uh, you know, there are, it's a kind of a, a make or break moment for us we can pick up from where covid leaves and uh, uh, you know thinking as though nothing has happened but we can also transform our societies exactly the way that uh, all the other pandemics uh, enabled us to do including the world war which i didn't mention so i want to show this clip uh, which is an interesting clip for you to watch this is 10 days ago in a rural kerala in india next to a teacher Two, three. The Morkanada AMAUP school is experimenting with augmented reality during their virtual classes. This is the LKG class of the school. It's not just elephants. In class six, a Hindi teacher stands next to a cow as she explains what a guide is. For class five students of social sciences, an artificially created solar system rewards in the classroom. Shyam, a teacher at the school, is behind this new development. Speaker P. Shivaramakrishnan and film director Lal Jose have appreciated the school for its efforts. Augment reality system of virtual class so, you know, this is just 10 days ago in rural Kerala, and I wanted uh, to show this clip so that uh, to give an assurance that uh, even th in the very remotest parts of the world uh, with a very limited uh, technology, connectivity, broadband availability, uh, there is uh, a possibility of uh, remote teaching, integrating uh, arti uh, artificial intelligence and augmented reality um, uh, in, the, in the learning practice. Although AR is uh, something, an idea that was presented as way back in 1901, um, when the when the word uh, came, came around by Frank Baum, uh, who, who mentioned about uh, this, we saw the emergence of virtual reality in 1989 when Jaron Lanier coined the word, uh, followed by 1990, Thomas Caudill, who put together the idea of augmented reality. But why are we talking it today after 30 years? It's uh, largely because uh, of the broadband availability today, wired and wireless, 
the abundant memory that we have, Moore's law is working, the fast input and output processes uh, that we have in the CPUs and GPUs. Uh, we also have uh, um, the high def definition display capabilities uh, with our smartphones, uh, uh, where we can overlay information. There are uh, uh, head mounted uh, uh, display, uh, glasses, smartphones. Uh, there are more and more devices uh, which are portable today uh, that use uh, light and uh, uh, also it's very light in battery and power requirements. So with, uh, with uh, such a scenario today in 30 years uh, where we have moved on from 1990 when the idea was proposed uh, to, to any surface that could be seen as uh, an opportunity for us to uh, ent uh, 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 introduce uh, augmented reality, we see that uh, the time has come for us not just to pile up, pilot but also to scale up. And uh, it's, it's a reality today that uh, AR in education is making learning interesting, visualizing complex concept is all the more possibility today. You can make uh, uh, your education globally available. You can refine your professional skills, uh, reduce the cost in the long run. There are more and more smart devices available and the technology is improving uh, every day. It's affordable, much cheaper, durable, so it's uh, abundant today. So that's one of the reasons that we are talking about AR. And uh, I want to show this uh, particular clip, uh, which uh, which is a kind of a, a just a graduate, uh, this man, a microbiologist who has come up with uh, showing what are all the simple possibilities today, combining a uh, 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 download, downloadable open source tool like Rosma with PowerPoint. What he has come up with, you can see for yourself. Let's start with the heart human heart now over here as you can see this particular object which is in two dimensional but as soon as you take out and you capture the image this gives out the actual three dimensional working heart and one more benefit of this app is the as soon as you click this particular object this will take you to the actual wikipedia page of the information regarding human heart you can see over here so this gives student idea the whole idea about the human heart as you can see the two-dimensional image does not make any sense how the heart works but as soon as you project and you capture the image it gives us the whole idea that this is the real heart and it, it and it is working over here then Let's start with the as you can see there are uh, various tools software open source and both proprietary and open source available today where uh, even uh, you know somebody who can uh, go through this for a couple of days uh, could come up with uh, integrating ar in education so over here what i've done it's a kind of uh, question answer type of thing where i can ask the student to name the parts of micro micro different parts of microscope and if they are unable to uh, give the answer, they just have to do what? They just have to project their smartphone with the cameras. And this app will give them the idea. As you can see over here, this is giving them the name of each of the parts of microscope. You can see that image. So this will help them to understand the microscope very well. And if they want more information, what they have to just do it, just click this image and this will take them to the Wikipedia page of this microscope and all the information regarding microscope. So over here. This is another example of how in over the fly, you could uh, actually come up with uh, augmented reality integrated into education. And as we speak, uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation and the Open University UK using Zapper as their base uh, uh, have come up with a, a series of uh, uh, AR learning series, which is being broadcast and also made available to the students uh, around the world. So to sum up, uh, you know, AR is here to stay. Uh, the projection is that uh, uh, 2.4 billion people by 2023 will be uh, using augmented reality. 
Um, so it's a huge number, which means you and I would uh, definitely be using augmented reality in our daily life. When it comes to the market share, uh, although it appears that manufacturing, construction, uh, communication, media, the public sector would be the main users, including professional services and retail, uh, you know, you can see that for the TVET sector, it presents a greater opportunity for us uh, to integrate uh, already uh, AR in our in our work. So what next? Um, I would like to say that uh, there is an opportunity for TVET sector to use technology more and more, uh, much much more than what uh, we are used to. Uh, we need to actually look at uh, ways and means to introduce uh, digital technology resources and manpower in our uh, training institutions, uh, particularly those uh, who could uh, emulate uh, what is currently seen as uh, uh, AR revolution in education, also in the TVET sector. So there is a need for us to focus more in uh, AR in TVET. And uh, we can also introduce a vocational stream, which is technology enabled education, whereby we can uh, uh, bring in uh, the faculty and the uh, uh, students who could work uh, solely in uh, integrating technology in education as a field of their choice, a vocational stream of their uh, uh, profession for the future. Uh, we need to definitely come up with a partnership with the industry, the uh, IT industry in particular, but also largely with uh, uh, the workspace uh, industry, the labor market industry, particularly uh, manufacturing, construction, and so on, which, which is something that we recognize uh, much more than before in recent times. Uh, we also need to come up with a consortium approach. For instance, in the Caribbean, if uh, we identify different agencies uh, similar to NTA and come together to form a consortium whereby we can focus, uh, each of the consortium members can focus on one theme within TVET sector and uh, to build uh, uh, AR libraries uh, to come up with uh, AR related uh, expertise uh, within our institution so that uh, we can develop our own curriculum and uh, uh, content and share with uh, the 10 others uh, if we have a a consortium say of 11 members so you produce one but in turn you get 10 so 11 uh, content uh, pieces are available to you so this is the way to save cost so to end my talk i would like to say that uh, only a crisis actually are perceived produces real change but um, uh, the crisis when the crisis occurs the action taken depend on the ideas that are lying around and there are quite a few ideas, uh, including uh, the idea of uh, using augmented reality and the virtual reality in Tibet. So it, it only the time on, time would only tell us uh, as to what we have achieved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shadra, for that wonderful presentation. Our next presenter comes to us with over 20 years of experience in information technology. She possesses strong competencies in systems analysis, business process re-engineering, project management, and policy formulation. She is currently the Deputy Program Manager for ICT Development at the CARICOM Secretariat in Guyana. In this post, she oversees and coordinates the CARICOM Girls and TVET partnership, and she actively contributes to a number of similar programs designed to strengthen the level of coordination, collaboration, and partnership among CARICOM member states, all with the goal of empowering women and youth through ICT. Once again, join me in welcoming Ms. Jennifer Gritton, who is now invited to make her presentation. Good morning, Ms. Griffin. Morning, Madam Moderator. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So morning again. Thank you very much. And um, I'm not sure if there are any ministers with us, senior policy practitioners in the region, um, the Cantor chairperson and the CEO of the NTA team, See, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in and out of CARICOM, and fellow presenters and panelists. I'd like to start by thanking uh, the NTA Trinidad and Tobago for inviting me. I CT people don't usually get invited to these exciting education 
um, events. And so I really appreciate the invitation. And also to uh, Dr. Eduardo Ali, who sought me out and I think made the recommendation. So thank you to both of you. I also uh, really thank the persons who've gone before. They've already given us a wealth of information. I've been scribbling and it, uh, it just gives us a lot of opportunity in the region, I think, to sit and uh, reprofile how we want to deal with TVET. I'm going to uh, just start, oh my screen, sorry. Just let me just start, start the presentation. Presentation up. Madam moderator, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful, but thank you. Uh, okay. I just wanted to give us some context. I think we've got context all morning, but some more context is that planning for educating is always an uphill battle. There's been, uh, there have been reports that said there's an approximate 100 year gap that was in about, um, in the early 90s, a 100 year gap between schooling opportunities and outcomes for young people between the developed and the developing world. And another study done at, in around 2005 says that uh, it, it will take eight to five years for about 1.6 billion people in the world to catch up with the right uh, type of education as we view it. So I wanted to look a little bit at some of the factors impacting the way we work and uh, operate and what will guide us and drive us with regard to how we uh, plan for TVET as we go forward. Everybody, or we're all familiar, I think, or many of us familiar with what is now called the fourth industrial revolution, which is really causing major disruption in the labor market. And since TVET is uh, focused on that market, it's one of the things that you need to keep in mind as well. And it is creating what is called the perfect storm of making many businesses change their models and in several industries. We also have to look at the future of work and in particular relative to all societies. I just put Caribbean and CARICOM there since I am representing the CARICOM Secretariat. But it really looks more to how we, uh, how we put value along the chain between work, the individual and society. And that is also causing new categories of jobs to emerge. And in some cases, displacing either wholly or partially some that we knew and held there. The skill sets which I have been alluded to and, and remarked directly by persons before me um, require some of are required in both the old and new occupations. They're going to change most of our industries, transform transform how and where we work, and they may affect female and male workers differently and transform the dynamics of the industry gender gap because of how uh, females are now allowed to perhaps participate a lot more wholesomely in the, um, in the whole work labor market. Also one of our drivers, we have a couple of economies emerging. There's a digital economy which uh, is really uh, fast tracked by digital technologies and looks in very uh, focused ways at how we connect what we uh, what data travels and is uh, value is added to in this economy, the jobs and skills required for that economy, and of course, uh, being able to pay and have good economic life therein. For us in the, in the CARICOM region as well, the blue economy is upon us and really looks at how we um, take care of the seas and the oceans around us, but also get economic, continue to get economic uh, uh, rewards from it while we take care of it in a sustainable way. So, and that also is spawning new jobs, new activity and all sorts of other uh, discussions. We also have in our midst as a region, the lack of skills being a strong, constraint to economic activity and it is also stymieing innovation. You'll notice on the uh, screen that Latin America is one of the highest scoring, this is not a good score, but highest scoring in the world, uh, similar to Africa, and they're both actually higher than the world average with regard to having unskilled workers and um, uh, weak regulatory systems and education being uh, identified as one of the uh, constraining factors. 
We also have this new entrant, COVID-19, and many uh, speakers before have also spoken about it. Uh, it's said that in the last 50 years, we've seen the biggest provision of in biggest growth in the provision of education at all levels across the world, but that COVID-19 now presents the greatest challenge to all of those national education systems that have done so well in the past 50 years. And we see that even while we had the uh, first phase and lockdown of COVID-19, 85% of the TVET institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean were completely closed. I don't have the uh, detail for CARICOM yet, but we're working on it. And so it's a big opportunity to uh, we've had to look at short-term solutions, but also to seize the opportunity to create long-term positive impacts and to develop greater resilience for our region. With regard to TVET and COVID, uh, many countries were forced into lockdown, but some of the challenges highlighted, and I just wanted to share some of you, some with you were that instructors were not properly trained to deliver uh, online courses. There was a difficulty in adapting what we already have into online formats. The lack or limited access to the internet was obviously a big one. Apprentices were ready for assessment but couldn't be assessed due to the same reasons and others. So we have some persons who are at the cusp of hopefully employment but waiting. And there's also um, the fact that students themselves who may have been uh, using these institutions were not able to access the resources needed to continue in an online environment. We also have emerging um, sort of silently, but definitely in the space, that many institutions, many learning institutions now and big universities and big learning bodies put a lot of their stuff online immediately with COVID. And so now TVET is being um, thrown into a pool with competitors who are as large as, you know, 400 year universities, et cetera, MIT, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, that type of thing. With regard to COVID and COVID-19 and technology, technology emerged as a sort of a winner in COVID-19. There was a lot of activity and it helped to fast track digital transformation for the most part across the world and to focus us in this region as to things we could do to help the digital transformation continue. It also helped us to wake up to the fact that customers are key and the customer experience is key and central to everything that we're doing. And so data and uh, artificial intelligence were used very heavily and will continue to be used to make that customer experience more valuable, more interesting. And as we think as TVET practitioners, how do we uh, factor that in as we factor around our customers? The uh, COVID and COVID-19 and technology experience also showed us that digital skills are critical, not only for being an IT person, but if you had the uh, functionality, for example, in your country to interface with your doctor, you had to be able to go on to whatever platform your doctor was using, more than likely it was Zoom in the first weeks, or uh, go to web, go to meeting as we're using now or something. So even as a private ordinary citizen, your digital skills also became critical in the uh, midst of COVID. And attracting the best talent now with regard to who, uh, who do you engage in your company or to work with you is also a big deal now because of COVID-19. Uh, so as we think about it, and I was um, asked to talk about innovation in tech, the story is more becoming, is it innovation in tech or by technology? We are being shaped by the tools that we ourselves created. We create them first, we shape them for what we think we want them to do, and thereafter they shape us as the quote on the left says. So um, ICT and technology is driving that digital economy we spoke about before, digital transformation is disrupting every sector. Um, disrupting society's norms and it's converging technologies will cause the changes in education capabilities and the needs and it's also placing a strong emphasis on skills more so than education uh, some of the skills which i'm sure you'll talk about in the course of this week are starting from the uh, left the one skills for those not yet employed those in employment but underpinned by all the skills we need for lifelong living and lifelong learning. At the policy level, obviously, we have international policy where all but trust and all our regions agreed to uh, develop the sustainable development goals. 
but we also at the regional level have many policies which already support what we want to do. Some of them are listed there. The regional strategic plan is a single ICT space roadmap and work plan, human resource development strategy. We just started um, a CARICOM Girls and ICT partnership initiative with several key international and regional partners. There's a TBET strategy. We have CXC policies, CVQs, there's Cantor's work, and obviously uh, sectoral plans and policies which support the work. So what are some of the imperatives for change in uh, making TVET learning um, qu and quality better than it is now? Obviously, the shift in the development paradigm, which I think Professor uh, Copeland talked about in his remarks, we're not only looking at economics in, um, in the new world, we're also looking at human development. People don't only want to make money, but they want to make that money and enjoy it in the ways they want to enjoy it. Uh, so education and training institutes are uh, being hard pressed to provide every citizen with the uh, learning skills that they need. And all citizens will need these 21st centuries, including basic skills, but we also need a high performing cadre of ICT graduates as well, who will help us to navigate this world. Some of the other imperatives are going moving towards digital in, uh, education, which brings in a variability of clients. It hopes to make education more affordable and um, has to be responsive to needs. Looking at digital citizenship as well, coming out of the digital economy and what we want our citizens to be able to do and driving the need for digital skills and future of work activity, which I think was spoken about by a presenter before. Uh, some of the data tells us that up to 85% of the jobs which the students have today, which will, the students will have in about 2030, haven't been invented yet. So we're working in a world where we don't know what we're actually trading for. And then today's students, those who are graduating in this year, will have about eight to 10 jobs before they're even 38. So between uh, the next uh, 18 to 20 years, those students are expected to have eight to 10 different jobs. Part of the imperative for change include that private providers have emerged, as I said before, and I think Dr. Shadrach just shared, Coursera, Microsoft is putting out a lot of digital skill, uh, skills trading. Flow Caribbean, as we note in some of our countries, uh, released hundreds of courses in the COVID-19 space. So the providers are also uh, different and emerging in terms of training. Credentials are not coming up as, as important as they were before. We no longer care to know your almost your tertiary level institution education, but what skills what can you actually do on the first day of job, on the first day on the job? And schools are no longer providing the knowledge or skills for good paying jobs. So that is part of what's helped forcing us to change. Awareness, employers are still not aware of um, what TVET institutions can provide. Incentives is another basket. What are we really giving teachers who venture into this space? What are we doing to incentivize their life? I think time is not on our side as well as an imperative for change and public systems which have held fast to being the bastion of the uh, TVET space are now having to respond to a market where they may actually find themselves at the bottom of the quality heap. And our biggest imperative for change, I think, in every society is that we want happy, healthy, thriving CARICOM citizens with an improved quality of life. So change in TVET is not coming. It's actually here. And so we've already started to talk about things like technology, enhanced TVET, digital TVET, and the constant um, struggle of responding between the skills and the job markets. We have to start thinking in terms of, we've already start think, started thinking about shifting from calling our, um, calling persons students to learners and what does that shift mean for us as we reprofile um, the industry. And, how those skills are achieved are actually um, skills for the technology oriented jobs are actually best acquired in a high tech learning environment and how do we provide that in the TVET world. TVET is already well placed, I, I believe speakers before have already said this, TVET was already focused on transitioning and change and aiming to provide our learners with skills for work and life. So um, TVET is already in that space and already accustomed to dealing with both public and private sector partners and looking at distance and 
learning and blended learning and e-learning, things like that. With regard to TVET and ICT, uh, there is obviously an opportunity to bridge the gap. ICT can be used in many ways, from being a tool to being one of your goals and how you profile for that activity to being a solution provider for providing um, experiences for all your problems from course identification to certification. T uh, technology can also make it easier to deliver the TVET and students can also now bring their own digital devices which takes some of the uh, burden off of TVET to provide classrooms and spaces for the actual learnings to take place. Innovation in ICT has been well mentioned by Dr. Shadrach. I'm not going to go through a lot, but the new paradigm in education and the change that we have to make really relies a lot on those innovations in ICT. And a number of massive online courses which are open have been uh, open to the world and a new recommendation by UNESCO has been adopted as of November 2019, giving us almost free entree to use those courses as we would like as part of the formal education tool. And they provide um, access to, some of them are free and some of them are relatively inexpensive so that we can access them a bit easier. And they're fostering the emergence of self-regulated educational online communities. I don't have enough time to talk about that, but it's an interesting part of the space as well, and how could we use them in TVET? Open education resources are there, and uh, the MOOCs are part of that, or they're part of the same body. But a study commissioned in 2018 found that OER, um, open education resources were widely unknown among TVET stakeholders. So we still have some catching up to do. Uh, there's student and learning management systems. Obviously big data is a big deal and there's opportunity for new jobs and new uh, skills to be acquired in that space. The smart rooms and ICT hubs and a number of investments made by our governments are now a part of this whole value chain and could and should be used. And of course, bring your own device and augmented reality and things like telepresence, which Dr. Shadrach spoke about. So I'm inviting us this morning to really think about uh, disruptive innovation and how would we use that to unleash the potential. It's not really used in this uh, particular uh, environment yet, but it's usually used where there's an untapped um, segment of the market which is not being fully um, unleashed. For example, Uber disrupted the taxi service and the transportation service. And so it's used in that way. But I want us to put our minds in that space and think about it. We have an untapped segment of market because there are several bodies of people I think we haven't touched yet. And it, it's, it's responsive to when you have few resources in your space and helps you to uh, deal with a lot of the operational efficiency. So we're going to try to disrupt um, use disruptive innovation by CARICOM TVET practitioners for CARICOM TVET practitioners and hopefully determine a niche in that market or perhaps a new model for how CARICOM TVET wants to see itself in two to five years. The impact of disruptive innovation is that it acts as a driver for innovation and it also can um, empower TVET institutions to develop that, a culture of innovation and fuel the innovation process itself. We've already heard and we already know the challenges related to TVET, and so I'm not going to go through them, um, but mainly I wanted to highlight the negative perception and image of TVET is one of the big ones, but which can also be helped by using ICT. More of the disruptive innovation means that we have to apply the 21st century skills ourselves, uh, those uh, relating to creativity, communication, et cetera, but in particular for the region, collaboration and cooperation. We talk about it a lot, but we don't really have uh, documented plans for how we're going to do that collaboration and cooperation. We have to identify new sectors and their needs. And the how is still on my mind, but we do have uh, teachers and practitioners who work in these uh, sectors. So we'll have to draw them into the circle to help us uh, increase the focus on employability skills to determine which programs can actually add value to the TVET value system and uh, move it along that chain and to create 
pathways and new pathways of study for our citizens. We also have to examine the changing and converging roles. A big thing in our mind, as I shared with you about uh, COVID-19 highlighting about customer interaction, who are the TVET customers now? What are their expectations and what are the, even their ages? Somebody before me talked about uh, TVET perhaps in tertiary and I, somebody else may have mentioned secondary, but a number of uh, countries are already emerging and starting to put TVET activities as early as primary and kindergarten because young people and uh, the younger children also need to start getting some of these skills around creativity and critical thinking from that age. One thing is clear is that our customers expect a digital process and that's from sign up to payment to even getting your certificate digitally. We do not want customers no longer appreciate and tolerate you saying sign up online, but yet go into your bank to pay or come into the institution to pay. So we have to put all of those things in our mind. And some of the changing roles, I'm just sharing a few before I wrap up. Canter will now be looking at the integration, integrated regional view of TVET and, and providing a platform for vocational excellence by bringing all the TVET institutions into that space. At the national level, the ministries and the TVET units and councils, et cetera, will have to try to uh, work on transforming themselves to innovation hubs, more doing the thinking of what is new in the space rather than being focused too much on the delivery. I believe that there's a lot of opportunity for the delivery to be done by uh, private public partnerships and so you uh, sort of farm out and push a lot of the pressure off of the TVET units to uh, that type of partnership and so that you can focus on resource mobilization, research and development because you'll have to look to see which open courses fit your uh, particular needs which and your client base and that type of thing. The TVET practitioners and teachers will become facilitators, but there's also the opportunity in our space to use them to identify some sector needs. We have uh, teachers who taught agriculture, physics, engineering, all sorts of things, and they could be used in different ways, I think, to bring um, back energy into the space. We can use retired teachers for some of this and to uh, really build it along the value chain. And we certainly need champions who understand the industries and can provide strong policy messages as we go forward so that we can bring more persons to the space. I'm about to wrap up. We have to develop new approaches, obviously, to look at uh, what model fits us. It's not a one size fits all. How do we derive new sources of income? Because we are going to be in a space where we're competing with everybody. So we also need to think about courses which can apply to any one persons in the CARICOM space and across the sea. People may want to deal, uh, work with us on uh, things de uh, dealing with the blue economy, things dealing with agriculture, which we have a lot of competencies in and that type of thing. Um, new relationships. Private sector shouldn't only be the persons we go for a handout when we want a course sponsored or a workshop sponsored. They now take on a, a, a almost a more collegiate role in the sense that we may be looking to them to actually uh, set up the smart rooms, set up the rooms where we can go and uh, experience augmented reality and that type of thing. Parents and community leaders are important because they need to spread the word and change some of this perception. Teachers colleges, of course, and ICT practitioners. You can't be thinking about uh, introducing augmented reality into your learning space and not talking to the ICT practitioners. Uh, and again, as I close, the big why for us is that we want to have happy, healthy, thriving CARICOM citizens who have an improved quality of life. I thank you, Madam Moderator. I may have been over my time, but I apologize on, for that. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, we must apologize. What is life without a little adventure? We seem to have lost our <laughs> connection for a little while. Um, but I believe that we are back on, so we are attempting to make contact with 
Ms. Richard once more for her to close off on her presentation. So please uh, humor us a little as we try to make that connection. Thank you again for your patience. Madam Moderator, can you hear me? I am hearing you. Thank you for, <laughs> for sticking with us. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not sure. I thought it was at my end. I'm not sure where I where you lost me in the presentation. Yeah, you... we are. We are, actually we are on Twitter now for ourselves. We just everything just kind of froze and then went blank. But we are back. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, do you know where you were? Okay. Let me see. I don't know. Had you heard the imperatives for change? Right. Remember? So you were, yes, you were in the process of going through that. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, I will just, um, I will go back. I'm sorry. Let me go back here. And I think um, I'm going, obviously your presentation is going to be shared. I just want to make these points because I think these are the important ones. I want to invite the region to, are you hearing me? Hear me? Yes, we are. Wonderful, good. Wanted to invite the region and our, our, our partners to really join in what I'm calling loosely um, disruptive innovation in the uh, TVET space. I'm using and borrowing the term from other industries, but I think it fits here. And it usually applies to where you have an untapped segment in your market and you're going to be looking at serving some customers who weren't previously served. And I gave the example that Uber is one of those that disrupted the taxi and transportation business. And so it, um, I'm inviting us to do that as we think about unleashing the potential in TVET. There is an untapped target segment. We have several other customers which we have not previously, I think, thought about um, in the TVET space because now we have to uh, develop all of our citizens in different ways. And it speaks to places where you don't have a lot of resources, but you need to correct operational inefficiencies in the current market. So I'm inviting us to uh, disrupt and innovate TVET, CARICOM TVET for CARICOM TVET, meaning the same practitioners must stay with us in this and help us to disrupt and innovate for a new uh, reprofile TVET. We have the opportunity, I think, in the region to determine our niche. It may be new, it may be an add-on, a new model, and we have to be conscious that one size does not fit all. But the impact of looking at uh, disruptive innovation, I think, will help us to position TVET as a driver of innovation in a coordinated ecosystem, and that the TVET institutions will then be empowered themselves to develop this culture of innovation and to fuel the innovation process, which is needed for uh, skilling and to um, apply the right persons to the right mar part of the market, et cetera. We've already talked about some of the challenges, uh, many presenters before me related to the TVET sector, but the one I wanted to just highlight here was the uh, negative perception and image of TVET, which is a big deal if we're looking to get new customers and to keep the other customers and also uh, perhaps outdated curriculum, which we need to look at, but which ICTs and the, uh, the open courses, which I mentioned before, can certainly help in uh, helping us to update that curriculum without a lot of work. In disrupting this uh, TVET space that we now live and work in in the region, we ourselves uh, don't only have to teach those skills, but we also have to apply them. Creativity, communication, critical thinking, and I think the big ones for us in the region are collaboration and cooperation, which we talk about a lot, but which we don't actually um, have a formal process for dealing with. We have to uh, give ourselves the space to identify new sectors and the needs of those sectors and think about how we will identify the new and emerging sectors. And there is um, opportunity with linking with academia, linking with teachers who are now uh, supporting the CXC curriculum and CAPE curriculum to identify some of those new sectors and new emerging trends to be able to figure out what type of skills we would want to uh, provide for learners. It will help with uh, focusing on 
new employability skills, adding value to the programs perhaps, and creating pathways of study so uh, our learners can actually see very quickly what the steps are to getting where they want to be. Examining and changing our, and looking at what our roles will be and the converging roles and capability is a big thing. We all as TVET customer, we all in the space have to examine who are the TVET customers, what are their expectations, and even what their ages are. Because we heard this morning that TVET is being applied already in tertiary and perhaps secondary schools, but some countries are already applying it at the primary level so that children can uh, start to interface with uh, creativity and critical thinking skills and even learning how to cooperate around those skills as part of their program in uh, primary and kindergarten. One thing is sure is that our customers now, given the COVID experience and the new uh, impetus of digital technologies, our customers expect a digital process from signing up for a course to payment to digital credentialing. We have a lot of issues and instances in our space where you can sign up happily online, but then you get a message saying, please go to your nearest bank or please come to our institution Monday to Friday to make your payment. So customers expect a different type of approach um, with the de digital technologies. I am proposing and just sharing some thoughts as to Canton now re-emerging itself. It's, holding on and spearheading the integrated regional view of TVET. I think we don't have any other choice other than to have a regional perspective because our markets individually are quite small and we need to punch above our weight in this respect. And Canto will then uh, transform itself into a policy makers platform for vocational excellence, pulling in all of the uh, TVET institutions around the region. At the level of the national level of the ministries of education, labor, TVET units, and that type of thing, you need to pull your stakeholders into um, what I'm calling, and not I'm calling is not a new, it's not coined by me, but an innovation hub where we do the thinking as to what are the, our new customers, how do we plan for them, what are the new sectors, how do we plan for those, what are the new things emerging in our space based on ICT and the opportunity to deliver. And those TVET units and councils will be more uh, involved in looking at resource mobilization and research and development more so than actually delivering many of the courses because I'm also proposing that the centers be public and private partnerships and private sector has a lot of um, experience in this as well and we're seeing more and more emerging since the COVID-19 activities so partner with them for actually delivering the courses so that you may become in some instances the actual customer of some of these centers to deliver the courses needed for your uh, customers. TVET practitioners and teachers can also be involved in uh, research and development. They have a lot of the sector uh, information that we need as to new and emerging trends and the teacher because our students are now being transferred to learners, our teachers will now be taking on roles of facilitators more so than teachers. And we also need champions in the space who will uh, provide and continue to advocate with strong policy messages to ensure that we draw new customers to the space as we continue. We also have to develop new approaches and models which are um, include perhaps outsourcing some functions. As I said before, the TVET unit may become a customer in some instances to, um, let's say for instance, somebody has a smart room that they have developed and they rent it. The TVET unit may be renting for the benefit of its customer learners rather than TVET trying to develop um, a smart room for itself while at the same time looking at course quality and delivery. Uh, there are going to be new sources of income, perhaps, hopefully, because we have courses which uh, could benefit persons across the sea and across the world. And so we should also be designing and thinking about those as other people in the customer space, not only our citizens. Obviously, new relationships and stakeholders will be foremost in our minds as we try to disrupt what is currently present. Private sector takes on a different role, not only for um, handouts, but they will also be close collaborating partners for us to deliver quality uh, learning and skills. And they also 
accept and receive the persons who we say are skilled. So the iterative process has to continue uh, daily, weekly with private sector. We have to be doing frequent labor market analyses to see whether where we're placing our value is still current next year and how do we move it along the chain. Parents and community leaders are always missing in our a lot of our planning, but if we want to change the profile and change the, uh, for want of a better word, the appetite for TVET, we have to engage those persons as part of our new disruptive innovative model. Teachers colleges go without saying, but ICT practitioners also have to be at the table as well, because if you're planning to deliver courses via augmented reality, you need to know what is being planned in the country, being planned regionally with regard to um, broadband expansion, whether we're going 4G, 5G, or whatever the case might be. And so again, uh, my uh, reason which I use for the imperative for change comes back as the reason for why we're doing all of this. We want to have happy, healthy, thriving CARICOM citizens who can uh, stay at home, but work across the sea and also uh, improve their quality of life by TVET learning opportunities. I thank you, Madam Moderator. So ladies and gentlemen, we would have just participated with two very informative presentations and we would like to thank both our presenters for taking time off the day to spend some time with us and give, a, give us a strong challenge. I think there's a common thread with both presenters in that they reminded all listeners that TVET was already well placed to serve as an innovative driver. They recognize the challenges, however, that we are facing regionally and internationally in this sphere. Ms. Newton went a step further by giving us a strong challenge at the regional level in terms of our consideration on the route forward. We have now come to our question and answer segment, and I will attempt to field as many questions to both our presenters <laughs> during this 20 minute period before we have our break. So I want to confirm that uh, Ms. Newton and Dr. Shadrach is uh, available and online to answer the questions. So let me just get confirmation from my team first. Yes. Good. Still here. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Okay. So I will start with Dr. Shadra. In terms of uh, your presentation as in regard to augmented reality and virtual reality, one viewer has asked. What is likely, these new innovations are likely to impact the competence of instructors and teachers. Do you have access to any research internationally or otherwise on the preparedness or willingness of the teachers to face this new reality? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, you know, it's, it's indeed uh, uh, the time for us to not just do market research, but get on with the job uh, of uh, getting on to the challenges that we are facing. Uh, that's what we witnessed uh, uh, by the school sector. When the pandemic erupted, uh, the, the school sector immediately responded by opening up online schooling for their, their students. Uh, when it comes to the TVET sector, as mentioned, uh, a large number of uh, uh, TVET schools are closed, uh, unfortunately, because we are not yet prepared to meet the challenge of uh, the uh, meet meet the challenges as of now. Uh, so that's that said, uh, you know, my only submission would be for us to quickly get on with the job and not wait for any market survey or any preparedness survey. It's it's uh, actors like CARICOM and others who would like to uh, propose. Uh, the way forward uh, next steps uh, with which uh, we need to simply move, move ahead. Uh, but to, to give one uh, word of uh, solace, uh, uh, although it might look challenging that uh, you know coming together is a difficult thing, but that's where regional institutions play a, a bigger role. Uh, but when it comes to integrating uh, artificial intelligence systems, machine learning, uh, AR, VR techniques, uh, it's uh, more than before easy. Now, even a, a, a middle school child can now use uh, some of the AR techniques, uh, you know, which is basically overlaying uh, uh, kind of on a on a real image, overlaying uh, 
the additional information uh, that makes it easier for people to um, and and uh, you know enjoy the joyful learn enjoy the learning as such uh, in a in a manner that it's real so ar is not uh, something very different uh, from a technology that superimposes uh, uh, a user's real world view for instance if you take a tvet practice uh, a user real world view can be captured today through uh, high definition cameras uh, where the virtual text and images in real time can be superimposed uh, and uh, that's that's uh, that's making a lot of difference and we are seeing this uh, actually already in practice in many schools and uh, colleges uh, it is not difficult for us to uh, uh, integrate this practice uh, it requires only minimal minimal preparedness i would think thank you for that and uh, segwayne on your comments about the role of the regional uh, organizations in spearheading such an innovations we have another question that says uh, what plans are there at the level of caricom to fast track the digital transformation that you spoke to miss Britton? And what exactly is the CARICOM vision as it regards to this transformation? Thank you. That's a good question. Can you hear me, Madam Moderator? We are hearing you. Wonderful. I think uh, there are a number of strands, obviously, which we couldn't talk about in this uh, time allotted, but we do have a, um, I would call a modern plan for digital transformation, which is embodied in the single ICT space work. And um, that that plan is available on the caricom.org website and looks at very uh, this segment dealing with ICT for the region. One of the things that is in, important in there to our discussion is that there's a whole component on bringing technology to the people, which is um, which takes in a lot of this work which we are talking about this morning and other things in terms of making our citizens as digitally skilled as they need to be or can be. So there is work on the uh, ground with regard to digital transformation in that plan, but digital transformation, as we've all shared, I think this morning, has other inputs such as um, skills, it has labor, it has um, other inputs for our region, and those plans are also um, well advanced for the most part. So I think there is um, good planning on the table to move us forward. I'd forgotten the second part of the question. I apologize. <laughs> so it was what plans for the CARICOM apart to fast track the digital transformation, and exactly what is the CARICOM vision for that transformation? Uh, I think the CARICOM vision is also embodied in our. Um, our plan, as I put in my presentation, to make sure that all of our citizens feel like they're thriving in uh, the in their life in, as CARICOM citizens, and also uh, giving the same experience to both CARICOM citizens and persons who come from outside of the region, where um, as it re so as it relates to technology in all of our countries. So we are working, the single ICT space has as its tenants harmonized things like uh, broadband speed for business, broadband speed for homes, how do we roll out and where do we roll out um, the broadband, uh, where does the, is the urgency for broadband roll out now vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID and that type of thing. So there is a plan, but there are several components, tenants and stakeholders which have to be in that space as we continue to move forward. Thank you for that. Dr. Shadrack, we are back with you again. <laughs> so you would have pointed to or alluded to the need for partnership with industry to make this event. So the question is, uh, what uh, examples or models exist as a best practice in making the environment more conducive for collaboration between TVET institutions and private sector organizations? Yeah, I think there are quite a few examples, uh, you know, when it comes to the private sector, we can see them as vendors or uh, vending technology. We can see them as uh, uh, people who uh, produce uh, uh, skilled manpower for us uh, in a targeted manner for a particular skill set that we we need to uh, bring in uh, to the to the ecosystem we can see them as collaborators uh, in the process uh, uh, 
uh, of uh, enabling us uh, to take on with uh, our challenge uh, uh, in this uh, particularly in terms of giving them giving uh, us the right to basically exploit technology not to be tied down uh, uh, with the technological provider there is also this open source community that is thriving in terms of uh, uh, introducing ict in education uh, uh, there, there are also national level initiatives in various countries where uh, the ICT skill manpower could be uh, made available for domestic needs. There are multiple ways we can integrate uh, the industry into the practice, but also equally so when it comes to the uh, integration of uh, augmented reality practices, uh, it's not just the IT sector, it's a combination of the IT sector and uh, the trade sector and the trade educators and the regulated bodies coming together and in this, uh, you know, as mentioned by uh, 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 the other speaker, Ms. Jennifer Britton, uh, it's it's important for uh, um, a regional cooperation uh, in such a way that uh, even if your market share is small, you could uh, have uh, the strength in terms of uh, using CARICOM and others as the platform for uh, these sorts of negotiation. But one underlying principle should be to ensure that you are not uh, you you are not tied to one particular vendor or one particular platform provider or a one particular uh, uh, company, you need to have that liberty to choose. But uh, you need to uh, you know engineer this uh, partnership in such a way that uh, it is a win-win situation for everyone. At the end of the day, win-win situation for the citizens per se, and uh, mm -hmm. in their ability to acquire skills and excel in their life. And that's where uh, organizations us have an important role to play uh, being the partnership brokers and negotiators. And speaking of partnership um, brokers, uh, Ms. Ms. Britton, the question is, uh, how can CARICOM support uh, the establishment of a community of practice that is related to augmented reality and those ICT programs? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I think, well, first of all, it has to be a whole ecosystem. Some of the issues that Dr. Shadrach mentioned before are part of this ecosystem. And uh, so it is a complex system and it needs to be a system which actually functions. So I think pulling together the, the IT competencies is not the hard part. It is where are they pulled together and when are they used? So, as I said in my presentation very quickly, you can't be planning for fabulous things like telepresence and augmented reality and then bring in the practitioners because they may know something that you don't know. So the question for me is more timing rather than how, but certainly we already have, and we already have at the, at the secretariat level, we have a group of all the, let's for example, the senior ICT practitioners in every country. But a lot of these are persons with regard to augmented reality and the higher level of technologies, maybe in the private sector. So it is constantly on my mind, and I'm sure the mind of other regional practitioners as to how do we make this uh, interesting and important enough because private sector is about you know um, chasing their economic gains they have to pay their staff they have to do other things and so how do we make it interesting and important enough for these people to want to join us and i i uh, suspect that as we continue to roll out uh, what we want to do in TVET to modernize the sector, I believe that a number of persons will want to join us. Um, there are words in the world like the coalition of the willing, but I think we need to do a little more incentivizing to bring them. So one of the issues may be that we uh, put incentives in there to have them join us formally. And those could be as much as if we train 10 of their staff, the staff members, per, training 10 of their staff members per month on simple courses, they get the uh, training very quickly without having to deal with that aspect of their work while they give us the expertise that they need. So it's still something that uh, I continue to think about with my colleagues. It's not um, anything that I can point you to at the moment, but obviously we have to put incentives into our space as the team ecosystem to make sure the private sector is really um, a day-to-day -day collaborator with us. Thank you. Dr. Shadrakov, 
on that point, uh, from uh, your Asian experience or the common, your wider Commonwealth uh, um, navigations, are there any examples or models that can be replicated as far as incentivizing training providers or their instructors to get on board with the initiative? I know you would have indicated that time is uh, now, so we need to get moving, but the reality is that we are dealing in many spheres with both large and small providers. So sometimes an extra encouragement is uh, required. So in your experience, can you advise us in uh, some of the strategies that have been employed elsewhere? Sure, sure. I think, uh, you know, there are umpteen strategies uh, starting with uh, quite a few technology providers, uh, whether it's Microsoft, uh, Intel, IBM, uh, and also Google of late, uh, uh, you know, which has come into uh, in a big way in terms of uh, providing Google Glasses to Google Classrooms and whatnot. You also have, uh, you know, providers uh, uh, that have emerged out of the education industry, uh, particularly from the US, like uh, Udacity, Coursera, and others that I mentioned. There are quite a lot of actors uh, who are willing to embrace uh, governmental partnerships uh, in terms of taking the education sector to the next level and uh, you know in in uh, in terms of uh, the responsiveness we have seen uh, a lot of uh, countries uh, such as malaysia for instance uh, um, uh, that that uh, that have taken advantage singapore another country that we can think about dubai there are there are uh, you know united arab emirates and others uh, you have seen a lot of collaboration in scandinavia uh, in Canada, there are there are uh, similar partnerships emerging. So we can see a lot of these uh, happening. It's uh, a matter of orchestration, and uh, uh, although you know there could be one view that the private sector needs to gain economic value for the shareholders, uh, there is also the there is this uh, responsiveness from the private sector that's expected, uh, particularly for uh, remote uh, communities. Uh, uh, where there is uh, not a major market well you know market share uh, you know these companies could have but still in terms of uh, impacting the nation and uh, as a success story they are willing to embrace partnerships uh, i think we need to begin from where uh, it's not difficult for us to you know even tap the known uh, actors in the field uh, uh, but when it comes to augmented and uh, virtual reality we not only have the known actors investing uh, uh, billions of dollars in uh, improvising the technology and making it available for common citizens. We also see small enterprises and small players emerging, and we need to encourage and incentivize uh, such players to also emerge from the Caribbean, where uh, you know, we, we, we could uh, not only incentivize and make it easier for them to add value to the education system, particularly the TVET system in this case, uh, but also portray them as champions for the region so that uh, you know we have uh, homegrown solutions but uh, supported by the larger corporations uh, for the benefit of uh, the local community by the locals you know that kind of a model could also emerge thank you very much and Ms. Turner, what are some of the challenges that you can see or expect in establishing an innovative hub in the Caribbean region for TVET and ICT. <laughs> Interestingly, um, my first, the first thing that popped into my head is that we don't even have a technical problem for that question. Basically, as I mentioned, the collaboration and cooperation is where we resist, and I'm not sure why, because, but it is probably bound up in the, in the, in the home of persons not being aware of the power of TVET. And so um, I think we need to build out the awareness while we try to uh, get on with the work. But collaboration and cooperation are words that we have bandied around at the regional level and internationally as well. But what does it really mean? Who is a collaborator and who's a cooperator? And I think we need to really drill down on that and having a really almost formal cooperation framework so that you ensure that you have uh, documented almost all the people who should be in this innovation um, ecosystem you and ensure that the, uh, the, the on trace to each are as respectful and as smart as they can be. And the technologies help us to do that a lot because we've seen that we are webinar weary since COVID-19, but a simple meeting of pulling persons together may 
be easier affected using the technologies rather than planning to meet in a country, which probably won't happen until 2021. So it's really collaboration and cooperation and working on a, a documented framework for moving forward, I think, would be the linchpin for us in the region. And our final question this afternoon is going to go to Dr. Shadrach. As it relates to open educational resources, do you have any advice in terms of where TVET teachers can uh, access material? We, 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 <laughs> they seem to have, be facing a challenge finding content relevant uh, resource material on those platforms. Any advice? Yeah, sure. I, I, I can, I can uh, you know, since uh, uh, Ms. Jennifer Britton mentioned about Blue Economy, I can point to a Blue Economy course that the Commonwealth of Learning has come up with, uh, actually developed by the Caribbean partners uh, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, which uh, deals with, uh, you know, the range of Blue Economy concepts to the opportunities and the challenges, uh, and how by actually um, harnessing the Blue Economy model, uh, uh, you know, we can not only protect the oceans and the ocean resources, but to maximize and optimize the resources. So, you know, I invite you to access uh, this particular course. But when it comes to OER in TVET, uh, we need to start a movement. Of course, Commonwealth of Learning, UNESCO, UNIWAC, and others uh, have uh, put out uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, undertaken a lot of efforts to bring together OER material. You also seen similar efforts by say uh, where Vancouver is located, the BC campus uh, providing uh, uh, OER grants to TVET practitioners to bring out uh, e-modules and uh, e-resources. E uh, there are open textbook projects uh, um, that, that are, that are uh, uh, there in the, in the fray for some, some time now. So there are many ways to bring in uh, open education resources uh, uh, for the aid of the TVET uh, educators and the practitioners uh, there. Um, you know, even the Commonwealth of Learning is putting together uh, a, a portal that would uh, enable everyone to download and uh, um, uh, capitalize on. You can go to colby.org, colvee.org, uh, where uh, you could find some resources. Uh, but I, I, I can say that uh, you know, going forward, uh, this is one of the things that we need to focus on. We need more and more open education, free resources uh, that are developed by the community themselves for their own use. So Madam, moderator, Madam moderator, yes, yes. may I just say yes. one thing? I think Dr. Shadrach answered it, it very wholesomely, but one other right. thing I think we miss as an opportunity for the region is that we too can add to these baskets of open resources and their courses that people will want to hear from us. So it's not only a take take situation, we can give and take as well and use them to barter and negotiate as we go along the uh, work. So we also have to keep conscious that a number of the things which may have even evolved in our space as um, what we view as negative, for example, the sargossum that was washing up on our sea, people may want to know how we removed it. What did we find that it was made up of? We may be able to put courses up like that as we look at other uh, facets of adding to the space. So we also have an opportunity there as well as a region to add to the open resources. Thank you, Thank you so much for that reminder that the, pen the pendulum swings both ways. Yes. yes, we definitely have to begin to join the conversation and allow our resources and our experience to be documented. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the close of this morning's first session in the National Training Agency's ETVET Convention. I would like to go on record and thank both our pre presenters this afternoon, this morning, sorry, and I will definitely be bold enough to say to Dr. Chadra that the National Training Agency will certainly be accepting his offer to lead the charge in getting a, enrollments for that uh, workforce uh, recovery program. Very so good. you will be definitely hearing from us. So at this juncture, we will be taking- The also open to the Caribbean community, so Ms. Yes. Uh, Britton can also take it. <laughs> oh, Thank definitely. you, Dr. Shadow. I'll be moving on. I'll be moving on it with them as well, <laughs> and my colleagues. Grabbing. So sorry sorry to, for, for forgetting you, Ms. Britton. Okay. I don't want to okay. grab. Yes, so at this point, we will be having our break. We'll be waiting for lunch for an hour. 
we are going to reconvene at 12.30 for our afternoon session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating and supporting us in this regard, and we look forward to seeing you logging back on this afternoon. Spread the word for any of your colleagues or friends who did not get a chance to log on. Let us keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. Do have an enjoyable afternoon and be back. And thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, NTA Trinidad and Tobago. I will make every effort to be on this afternoon, and I'll try to join you on Friday as well. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Dr. Bye, Shadrach. We'll be in Bye. touch. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Additionally, of course, which is what the um, topic implies, I'll be looking at the impact of online training on skills development in the region and framework for considering teacher competencies in intensive online environment. Now, in 2012, UNESCO advanced in a publication that TVET needed to focus not only on the basic entry-level technical and vocational skills for specific occupations, but on developing higher order skills demonstrated by globalization and generic attributes required for working in the 21st century, such as the ability to work independently. The speakers before me would have articulated how the expectations of workers have evolved due to the knowledge economy and required competencies for the digital era. So I don't necessarily want to repeat some of those, but just to emphasize the fact that massification of higher education and a rapid advancement in technologies now require a new set of skills for the labor force and employability also dictates that the learner now needs to be able to use the new technology and digitization has now become a factor. Universities have incorporated skill development in curriculum or vocationalization and the gap, and, and this is so to bridge that gap between academic and vocational training. I'm not seeing my screen, so I'm just adjusting the section here, right. And this is done through partnerships with the industry to ensure that the workforce aligns with industry demand, as well as the mobilization of a critical mass in enrollment. As a result, we now see an increase in access to TVET. So there is a prevalence of computers and software technology that facilitates simulations, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, video conferencing, and other computer-assisted learning tools. This is also enabled by the introduction of mobile learning, smartphones, tele tablets, and also there we've seen where there's an expansion of learning to marginalized, marginalized groups and communities that have been underserved. The inclusion of open education resources have now increased access to TVET. And we, we have seen where uh, others before me would have spoken to some of these. So basically, um, as mentioned before, I'm looking at the fact that TVET can be considered as an innovation in the region. The use of the readiness factors related to the implementation of an innovation was the degree to which there was a formal rec recognition within the school system of unmet needs. Now, in the context of my presentation, an innovation is defined as the process of translating an idea or invention into a good or service that creates value or that the customer will pay for, right? Now, others express that the newness of the process of change as an essential consideration to the uh, innovation process, right? So the newness is what they consider to be an essential um, part of innovation. So I would be looking at change and innovation uh, synonymously. So if I use the term uh, innovation or change, I'm really looking at uh, the same thing. I am representing the University of the West Indies Open Campus, and so I will also be looking at the University of the West Indies as a case when I am giving some illustrations. So the University of the West Indies has indicated in its first strategic plan that one of its goals was to seek to train people in disciplines of critical importance to the region 
and to strive for excellence in teaching and research. The UWI acknowledged the fact that in order to facilitate human capital formation and foster lifelong learning for citizens, a new framework that could support knowledge-driven economies was needed. At the time, there was an unfilled demand for tertiary education and training in the Caribbean region. A large portion of the population was unable to access education due to varying reasons. And some of these include due to family obligations, or they may be living at a far distance away from where they may be able to access internet connectivity. So the UDEC of campus facilities were established, but then they actually began to face difficulties with the fact that students still had difficulties accessing these facilities. There are other potential students who may be having difficulty or they may be unwilling to sacrifice their family or jobs or who do not have the financial capability to cover travel expenses or boarding in addition to the tuition fees. So these persons were unable to fulfill their desire for acquiring higher education. It was against that background that one of the strategic objectives included in the U.S. second strategic plan for 2002 to 2007 was the expansion of access to students specifically by increasing the distance education enrollment. So the attempt to establish all campus centers at strategic locations around the region was done to allow students who do not have access to support mechanisms similar to the main campus. And it was not long that the UWI discovered that there was limited capacity to offer students physical seats on the campuses and at these off-campus sites. Therefore, it was essential that the technology be leveraged to expand the offerings to learners, especially in remote locations, to satisfy the need for a scalable student population. Therefore, to allow for greater efficiencies, structural changes were done and as mentioned before, the UA Open Campus was established with an autonomous structure, including a principal registrar, chief financial officer, a librarian, and an academic programming and delivery division, which had responsibility for developing online training. The Open Campus provides flexible support in either a blended or online modality. It is important when implementing any change that institutions identify and assess the need for that innovation based on the importance relative to other needs before an innovation is being implemented. Because people often become clearer about their needs only when they start doing things that is during the implementation itself. Competency-based training has its roots in the behaviorist approach. Behaviorism is based on observable changes in behavioral patterns and new behavioral pattern being repeated until it becomes automatic. Now, for those of us who are involved, and I would imagine most of us online are involved in TBET, you would understand the reason behind me speaking to behaviorism because competency-based training is a big part of TVET, right? And competency is defined as an observable ability of an individual related to a specific activity that integrates knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. So just to define that for those who are not familiar with this area then you have other learning theories which include constructivism so the theorist by 
advance that knowledge is socially constructed, meaning, and it is built upon what learners contribute and construct together. The constructivist approach to learning are grounded in the work of theorists such as Piaget, Vygotsky, John Dewey, and Jerome Bruner. An essential tool for effective online learning development and facilitation is to select and apply instructional strategies based on an understanding of andragogy. The online environment is designed to support a constructivist approach to teaching and learning. Andragogy is on the constructivist side of the learning philosophy continuum. This means that learning is an internal and interpretive process of construction on the part of the learner. Online learning platforms allow for this and is ideal for collaborative construction of socially constructed knowledge. The discussion forums enable this, but specific learning activities such as writing a storyboard can be used to guide learners to apply knowledge in actual work environment. The Open Campus actually uses an experiential learning approach and our principal, Provost Chancellor uh, of the University of the West Indies, Dr. Lucy Longsworth, would have made a recent presentation in this area. Uh, so experiential learning involves concrete experiences, which involves activities which are well-defined and grounded in real life experiences, reflective observation, learners consider implications of assumptions, beliefs, decisions, and actions, and abstract conceptualization which basically refers to the interpretation, meaning, and significance of growth. And finally, active experimentation, which refers to the application of experience to other situation or context. So there we can see that there has been a shift to online training, and this involves a student-centered approach incorporating prior learning, which may allow for experience in, in technical, vocational, and higher education to be used in the matriculation process, and an integrated approach to course development. The online training also facilitates higher cognitive thinking skills and a shift from passive to active learning. The online learning environment, it facilitates more engagement. Learners are expected to complete quizzes, debates, participate in discussion forums, and other exercises which requires reflection and therefore promotes higher level thinking. Active learning approaches facilitated in the online learning platform include cooperative learning, collaborative learning, problem-based learning, project-based learning, and experiential learning. I would have mentioned the flexible approaches to matriculation. At the Open Campus, we have a prior learning assessment unit, which actually allows for persons to be matriculated using their tech box qualifications or experience on the job. And this is done through an assessment process that occurs before you enter the university. The Open Campus also uses a laddered approach to learning. So persons who might have done a diploma program would be able to use that as matriculation into a higher level program perhaps an associate degree, moving on to the bachelor's, master's, and then to be engaged in doctoral studies. And so this is just a photo here demonstrating what the Open Campus's learning platform looks like. 
it is very integrated. You have access to different features such as your calendar to schedule your learning activities. And then of course, you have your student handbook and other areas which may be of use to you. Now the online training environment does not come without limitations. There is a cost of technology and equipment and software. The learning approaches adopted may not necessarily be suited for online learning. There may be gaps in experiential learning. Also the quality standards that have been adopted. And there's the issue of benchmarking with international standards. There are other, other factors which may impact the skill development in online training. These include demographic differences existing between learners studying online and those face-to-face. -face. Researchers have indicated that more females appear to choose to study online. But although we have more females studying online, males seem to be more confident using the technology and tend to get higher paying jobs or top positions. Now, how can we use advocacy for TBIT to change that? Techno technical support required for learners may also be a factor which impacts the skill development in the online environment. Factors relating to success in the online environment. Now, adequate quality and frequency of interaction between a student and instructor increases student core satisfaction. And these are based on empirical research that would have been conducted by researchers, whether at the UWI Open Campus or elsewhere. Instructor presence is the most critical uh, factor which we have found contributing to student success online. And I would have also conducted some empirical research which would have collaborated uh, or corrob corroborated, sorry, um, this finding. So we need to have instructor to learner engagement with the content, also instructor to student interaction and learner to learner engagement, as that facilitates the co-creation of knowledge. Her experience using computers has also been found to be a factor to student success. Self-directed learning, students' ability to work autonomously and manage their time effectively in the online environment is also a factor providing orientation services to integrate incoming cohorts into online learning and providing a sense of community, introducing self with videos and photos. You can see on screen here in one of our courses, we have an introduction being made using video. So the more interactive the learning environment, it's the more engaged you find students will become in the environment. They will be posing questions. They will be asking questions of their, of their peers as well as their instructor. And there will be more co-creation of knowledge in the environment. So technological requirements made known prior to the com commencement of the course is also important because then that allows the student to become more prepared for the learning environment. And of course, and this is very topical, the health and well being of the student. So the institution usually provides online counseling or other support that will contribute to the health and well-being of students. You may integrate uh, content in the environment for students 
such as uh, a webinar, a link to a webinar, which may help them to uh, develop better coping skills while they are studying. Now, what are some of the impacts of online training on skills development at the UE Open Campus? To date, and I'm referring to this academic year, 16,441 students have enrolled in continuing and professional education courses. There has been a wide range of technical and vocational, as well as continuing and professional education courses being developed. There has also been an expansion of partnerships with industry, with multinational agencies, as well as others in government and other stakeholders. And th these partnerships often involve support for the development of these specialized training, which helps to expand TBET in the region. A very important role that the Open Campus has played in rolling out online training is the capacity building of teachers in the region. And the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has actually uh, increased the demand on the campus to provide such facilitation. We have had 962 facilitators or lecturers trained at our sister campuses since the COVID-19 had 752 teachers trained across the region, and these numbers are continuing. So we are still in a process of facilitating training to facilitate uh, online training as a result of the social distancing requirements that has been brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Another area is the development of digital certification. Oops. And of course, the range of technical and vocational education training that has been done across various sectors cannot be overlooked in terms of the impact that the campus has had on online training in skills development. At this point, I'd like to look at a framework for considering teacher competencies in an intensive online environment. This actually is a model that has been advanced by Mishra and Kola. So there you see the importance of the technology, the pedagogy, knowledge, and content has been outlined here. There are overlaps, and basically what the model is putting forward is that teacher engagement is a critical success factor in the online environment. Building teacher competencies to facilitate online or blended learning instruction is very important. And so this TPAP model fosters integration of technology content, knowledge, and pedagogy. Pedagogical approaches should involve teach learner competencies, preferred learning approaches, and characteristics. And we would have looked at some of the learning approaches before. So technology is inherently embedded in the content delivery and influential in approaches to teaching. Now, persons who are involved in instruction would argue that the technology supports the learning and not necessarily drives it. It's really the learning approaches that are adopted and of course the facilitation skills. Then there is a technical competence which must be demonstrated together with content proficiency and pedagogical knowledge. So how does the technology integration enables positive learning outcomes? 
a study that was carried out in Africa shows how this happens in that context. And I believe, or I submit, this can be applicable to the region. So they found that there was an increase in students' motivation, improvement in teacher training and teaching itself, as I would have demonstrated earlier. There was an improvement in the understanding of how to make effective use of technology. There was also an increase in the effectiveness in education systems and infrastructure. Then of course, the emergence of new methods of learning and teaching, and importantly, the increased access to resources, information and knowledge, which we would have spoken about through OERs, MOOCs, and so on. Just to show you a demonstration of how media is embedded in content delivery. So for one of our courses, a step-by-step -step guide to exporting, well, this was actually an online workshop that was done in collaboration or on behalf of one of our partner. And as you can see, we have a video presentation which is embedded in the learning management system. Another example of how media can be embedded in the content delivery is this illustration where in the learning environment, we have meeting rooms, so Blackboard Collaborate can facilitate instruction. So you may have a group size of 300, but you can use the technology to have smaller group. So students can be divided in say groups of 20 or 15 or however many you would want them to be divided in to have smaller project-based uh, learning outcomes being achieved. And then finally, I would like to show you, because we have been talking about the importance of instructor engagement and the importance of having teachers training to be able to facilitate competent delivery in the online environment. The teacher training program that the University of the West Indies Open Campus delivers, it is designed for flexibility, so it can be customized in terms of the level of content, the time frame in which uh, our partners uh, desire that training to be conducted in. Uh, it has this particular one here has two components and one component involves the course development for online learning and then the other component involves the facilitation element. So here you see in this component one we have the design phase which really looks at laying the foundation, theoretical underpinnings of instructional design. And in phase two, it looks at the content development of the course material. So while you are learning, you're actually engaged in active development of a course material. So there is the experiential learning coming into play there. And at the end, you review and revise the course materials based on feedback from the facilitator of this particular course. In component two, you have a mastering instruction in online environment. And this gives you an introduction to Moodle, or it could be another learning management system, depending on what the client requires. And the capability of our experts in the campus. So we would have some capacity in other areas, other learning management systems. Then it also involves the managing and facilitating online instruction. 
just to pause here to say all the instructors at the UE Open Campus would have had to undergo this particular training before they are able to facilitate learning in the online environment. So it really looks at the whole uh, business of how to develop strategies for better engaging your, your uh, learners in the environment. It also looks at competency development in particular areas of assessment and so on. And then there's the area of embracing student-centered delivery. So this is a very key course that the Open Campus has been delivering to develop competency in the region in the area of teacher training in online and blended learning. And a lot of our stakeholder institutions, educational institutions, have been approaching the Open Campus because they have recognized that this is very important in rolling out any online training in order to optimize on their ability to develop skills in the region. Other courses on offer at the Open Campus would include uh, those that are listed here, and actually those are courses that are listed in uh, offered in Trinidad. So for those persons who are physically in Trinidad, you may or may not be familiar with those program offerings. Around the region, we have several continuing and professional education programs that are delivered online. So for example, we have programs in transformational leadership, supervisor management, project management, et cetera, which tends to be targeting the higher level skills. And so in conclusion, TVET systems and institutions need to develop their own rigorous quality assurance processes and practices. They need to embed continuous self-improvement in all of their operations, monitor and assure quality in their curriculum, pedagogy, delivery and assessment methods and qualifications and provide evidence of relevance to industry and societal needs. The leveraging of the technology cannot be overstated because it's also a very important factor in not just be used, be used as a tool for delivery, but in terms of how you uh, strategize in the learning management system and create your learning activities to achieve the specified learning outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wells, for that uh, very informative presentation. So as we continue, our next uh, presentation will be co-presented by two knowledgeable gentlemen. Mr. Kopi Tony and Mr. Rodney Ho. Mr. Tony possesses 13 years experience in the field of TVET, for which he has spent as the manager of assessment development at the National Energy Space Center. Mr. Tony has a strong passion and competence within TVET, having been a true example of the successful benefit that TVET has had on his life. Mr. Tony's co-presenter today is the Dean of School of Continuing Education at Red Deer College in Alberta, Canada. Prior to this, he served in the post of Associate Degree Dean, sorry, Business Development Manager, Program Coordinator, and an adjunct faculty. He is an avid explorer of all modes of educational delivery, assessment, and learning. Mr. Tony is going to start, and then we're going to be eventually joined by Mr. Holt by the online platform. So, let us welcome and invite both gentlemen to our forum this afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Sills. 
appreciate your welcome. Thank you and good afternoon to all the participants uh, in the e-conference right now. On behalf of Mr. Holt and myself, I want to thank the NTA, National Training Agency, for the opportunity to speak on the topic of virtual and augmented training. Uh, this is a unique scenario in a TVET context, and we will share with you the experience of the NESC, the, the experience the NESC has had in augmenting its delivery due to the restrictions Im imposed as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, quite aptly, our implementation strategy was tagged muzzling COVID-19. Let me first though invite Mr. Rodney Holt to share his thoughts on the topic virtual and augmented training. Hi Rod, are you there? I am. Can you, uh, get my audio coming in clear? Yes, it is. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's always a great opportunity to, uh, to connect with global leaders on this important topic. And uh, thank you to our partners at the National Energy Skills Centre for inviting us to participate today. Um, so I'm very passionate about digital learning in the TVET, uh, in the TVET model. Uh, myself and my colleagues here at Red Deer College and the School of Trades and Technology and the School of Education uh, over the last number of years have been uh, passionately working towards developing new and alternative pathways for TVET learners to uh, engage in online learning, uh, to engage in learning in their homes, in remote locations, uh, to embed and incorporate new technologies that allow learners to uh, control and to take ownership of their learning and become self-directed learners. Uh, and, you know, as we're all facing a global pandemic of COVID-19, uh, it's it's drastically forced our hand to uh, to make uh, stronger preparations and stronger um, stronger uh, propositions to make this move forward a little bit further. I think really the most important things that we've learned and that we focus on is preparing a student to be a digital to preparing students and in increasing their digital literacy. Uh, the uh, the presenter before us did an amazing job talking about, you know, individuals' access to technology, use of tools, the support of students uh, uh, through the digital learning platforms, uh, which is phenomenal and, and great and a great resource. Uh, but I think it's important for us to remember that uh, traditionally, uh, TBET training and the students who go through this program are conditioned to be taught and they're conditioned to to learn in environments where they're sitting face to face in front of instruct instructors who walk them through the theoretical uh, competencies and theoretical knowledge, and then transition into a, into a shop or into a learning environment where they get to walk through hands-on skills. And uh, when, we, when we flip the classroom and shift it into a, into a digital environment, uh, the students now have to own the responsibility to be engaged as a learner, as opposed to being a passive learner. And so it's really important that institutions and instructors that we develop and we're intentional about improving the digital literacy uh, for those individuals. And I think, you know, this, the last point I'll make before I turn it back to, to Mr. Tony is um, we, have an, we have an abundance amount of tools available to us as, as training institutions, whether it's Blackboard, Moodle, uh, Adobe Connect, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, and all of these online learning platforms have tremendous amount of tools uh, for us to be able to use to enhance the learning. And sometimes the, uh, the, that vast array of choices um, is tempting for us to incorporate lots of things that can be a learning distraction. And so we have to be really intentional about the number of tools and the number of technologies that we introduce in the learning environment so that the tool is not a distraction from learning. And we have to be really intentional that each online learning activity we create, that there is an opportunity for the students to be engaged and for the students to then show and demonstrate their understanding, their learning, to be able to pull forward. The greatest advantage to online learning is our ability to assess in small microbyte uh, sections through the learning experience. Online learning is amazing for us to check in more regularly with students than in a traditional face-to-face uh, -face classroom. Um, the last point is um, digital learning is a, huge, uh, is a huge factor for the administration of an institution. It's an investment. 
Uh, it's an investment in the technology, but it's also an investment in the development of our staff, our instructors, and our support systems. And so this, the decision to move into that online environment uh, cannot be a single initiative held by one individual. It has to be an institutionally shared passion uh, so that the whole organization can support that transformation. Thank you, Rod. And, and just moving forward, I'm, I'm happy with where Rod finished off because as an institution, NESC, as we were thrust into this new environment, we really relied on the support of Red Deer College, our training partner, to be able to move our, our program forward in the online environment. And when we started off, the, the stay-at-home order proved to be actually a hectic time in our delivery because we were just at the end or towards the middle actually of our second trimester. And as the first week passed and we saw the uncertainty in terms of how long the, we would be out of, of, of training, we realized we had to devise a plan for online learning within the institution. With the focus of our training being competence development, however, which of time is, is necessary. So it meant that we had, by introducing online training, we were really pushing ourselves into the blended learning environment. And our aims were speaking very clearly to what we wanted to achieve. And the first was to continue the education and development of our students while they were at home due to the COVID restrictions. Because once the students were at home, we needed to make sure that they were engaged in something meaningful for when they returned to classes. Secondly, we, we looked at our ICT resources and we wanted to capitalize on the development of those resources through online training, through building learning capacity at the institution. And we involved our staff, the instructors and students in this process. We had to actually maximize the use of the time as I said before, we were unsure of whether or not we would be out till April, we'll be out till June, or we'll be out till September. So we really wanted to make maximum use of that time at home. And most importantly, we had to prepare our students for competence development in the workshop for when they return. So at, at the moment, we're thinking September, but we had to do that through front loading the theoretical concepts that would normally be taught in the face-to-face -face environment. And within any of any institution, going into something new, we really had to look at what restrictions we would face in that time. And for us, I mean, the most important part of it would have been the in insufficient courseware in that digital format. We've actually spent 20 years in this industry, but we've been building up content, but the content is really printed content. It's not content in a digital format. Anything that's in a digital format is a little bit unstructured. So having not done online training before, we didn't really build enough of that content up. The, digi the low digital le literacy levels of our students and faculty. You know, people may think that because of social media, all students are actually digital, digitally literate, but that's far from the case. While you may be used, able to use WhatsApp, you may be able to use Instagram, it does not necessarily translate into the overall use of technology. So we had to look at that. We looked at the access to digital devices, by both students and faculty, because as I said, students were not accustomed to being online. And most students have a cell phone. But beyond a cell phone, in terms of a tablet or a laptop or any other device that would allow them to log on or to go online for online classes, a lot of students did not have access. And they did not even have access to the internet. And it was similar for some members of our faculty as well. All of this really looked at the inexperience of students and faculty in an online learning environment. So that even though we may think that we are online all the time, learning in an online environment is very, very different. NSC did possess Microsoft Teams, but we had not yet operationalized it from the standpoint of online learning. And of course, where students are at home, there are certain pressures with that, that would involve teaching and learning. And it's as simple as finding a quiet space to study at home, to just finding something else to do while at home and not really being interested in, in teaching and learning. But with all of that, we looked at our resources. And I must give, must give um, credence to the, the work put out by our instructors and our staff in this regard. As I said before, we did have Microsoft Teams and we had a license for Microsoft Teams in terms of using it for online trading delivery. So that was one of the positives and one of the resources that we already possessed. All of our students had email addresses. And those email addresses we, we would use as the user accounts to access Microsoft Teams. We already were doing online exams. So our exams are at the end of each course, 
and are done with students logging with the credentials and logging into the RDC website because they host our exams for us through Blackboard. So our students were accustomed to logging in and putting in their credentials and being able to access content online from that perspective. And we have a, a, a network infrastructure. And, and I think every organization at this time has looked at the IT department quite differently. Because before, you may have been criticizing and complaining about your IT department. But our IT department really did step up to the, to the plate. And they allowed us to, uh, we had access, we had remote access. And all of the, the necessary network resources were made available. And as I said, we had experienced IT professionals throughout our organization. We do have an IT program as well. So our instructors in the IT program were able to assist in terms of bringing us on in online delivery. And once again, we had REC, whose expertise was really important in guiding us towards implementation. And I would just like to reintroduce um, Mr. Holt to speak a little bit about that expertise that REC was able to provide for us. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're really excited about our, our continued affiliation partnership with NESC and our trades professional certificate. Um, you know, one of some of the things that uh, we work with at NESC is to take the learnings that we have with online testing, uh, with online delivery, uh, and allowing students to have freer access into, you know, into a into a into learning content today, especially in a, in a COVID-19 world. Um, I think one of the things that we're really proud of is by allowing students to challenge exams and write exams um, at a time that's available to them on a device that's available to them uh, enables them to to complete the exam when they're ready. And you know our traditional methods in in Tibet training is we go through a long period of learning and then you do a an assessment at the end of the exam and some of the content and learnings that the student had gone through is is pretty old and outdated it may be several weeks or even months uh, months ago um, our work with NESC has allowed their students and well I will say our students because it's a dual credential program to be able to challenge assessments and exams uh, at the conclusion of their learning uh, really allowing them to demonstrate what they what they know uh, at the time and it's it's a confirmation of what does the student know versus what don't they know um, and i think that's really important as educators is that we're creating assessments that really allow the student to demonstrate their knowledge and it really allows them to to show and express what they've learned as opposed to what to, to as opposed to what maybe they they aren't able to express and we know traditional forms of assessment aren't very successful uh, traditional forms of, of multiple choice exams um, are not true measures of assessment. In fact, it's the lowest form of assessment. Um, and the, the new methods of assessment that we're using with NESC through online testing, uh, being innovative and creative, allow those students to, to feel confident, allow them to express what they know and allow them to move forward. Uh, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is, is, the, uh, is the adoption of the technology and the strategies of the NESC faculty. They are examples of lifelong learners. They're showing the example to their students that learning doesn't stop at the end of the program, that they're gonna to continue to reinvest in their knowledge uh, on a continuous basis as they go forward in their careers. And the programs that we've set up and that we're partnering with with NESC really prepare the future learners in a TVET world to have continuous learning and continuous improvement throughout their academic careers, but also through their professional work lives. Thanks, Rod. So in terms of us bringing the, the online program into fruition, um, we had to look at a specific approach. And the first thing we did at the NESC would have been to develop and agree on a training framework. And this was done through our teaching and curriculum department with the work of the SMEs, our subject matter experts, and the faculty, the instructors, to develop a framework, to develop and agree on a framework that we would use to take the, the implementation forward. Next would be the, the, to ascertain the readiness of our students to participate in online delivery. Because as I mentioned, students going home, a lot of students got involved in other activities. We had to look at the internet access. We had to look at the devices that they would have had and whether or not they would be able to participate in online training. We move then to the fact of preparing the faculty and staff for online delivery, because it's not just about the instructors. It's also about the administration, those that prepare the exams, 
those that um, prepare the rooms, the IT infrastructure to get things done. So we had to prepare the faculty and staff for online delivery. We also looked at filtering the course content to identify learning objectives by two in two parts. The first was really to develop, to look at the online content, what will we deliver online? And our approach to this was to deliver theoretical concepts online, everything that would prepare the student for when they return to the workshop. And then we looked at what needed to be done at the campus, the, co the competence development that activities that needed to be done. So this was twofold. So you had to actually filter the content. You had to look at, okay, when students get into training down at the end to develop that competence that we say that they're going to go out into the industry with, how am I going to prepare them for that? So we looked at the various objectives throughout our curriculum and said, okay, these concepts, these um, objectives could be delivered online. So anything to do with the science, for example, of welding, we look at the science of welding first. So that once the students will have covered an area like that and they understand how to apply that science, then you take them into the workshop and you apply. So that was the approach in terms of the content. We looked at developing the learning content and the formative assessments at that particular point in time. So identified, having identified the objectives to be delivered, we now had to build that digital content to get things going. And of course, once you've, all this is, is wrapped in a nice little bow, you have to then communicate the information to the, to the students. So we developed our schedule for delivery and gave information to our students in that when they would come online, what days, what times, what they would actually be doing in those online classes. Once everything got going, you must monitor and evaluate. NESC really believes in that PDCA format. We plan, do, check, and act. That is actually how our, our uh, procedures are built. So we then move into that phase of, of monitoring and evaluation against what we expected to happen against the learning outcomes. And what you're gonna see here is actually what our framework looks like. And it may look a little bit complicated on the screen, so I hope everyone is seeing it, it's seeing it okay. And we started off looking at our teaching and curriculum department. The aim basically was to design the curriculum, course, curriculum and the courseware for use in that online environment. So we looked at our curriculum design and the material and started planning how we were gonna treat with this particular material going forward. This process, and you would see the box in red, is led by our SMEs, our subject matter experts, who would coordinate the putting together of the classes, they would coordinate the materials. So all teaching and learning material actually came to them for them to approve because we wanted to standardize it across the board. Being the first time that we were delivering online, it was really important that the material was approved material to go forward and covered the objectives that we wanted covered in the classes. We broke up our classes into actual groups of 20, with each e-tutor having a group of students to focus on. In some cases, it went a little bit over, some cases it would have gone underneath. However, we really wanted to make sure that students had access to an instructor who could give them that meaningful feedback that they would have needed, who would actually put across the class activities, the one who would, who would administer those formative, that formative assessment and give the feedback. The students had a particular role to play, and their role was to really attend and to participate and prepare for classes and ensure that they would have done the assessments. It was really a team approach because if you look at our model, every single department that is involved in teaching and learning is represented on the model. So at the campus level, persons at the campus were responsible for registering students if a student had an issue in terms of the email account, gaining access, um, having trouble participating, they didn't have a device to log on, they had challenges with internet access, we provided solutions to those students. And the, the various other departments, my department, the testing department, made available all assessments that needed to be done. Student support gave guidance to those students who were challenged in getting on, who may have had other issues resulted that would have prevented them from being able to log into the classes. They dealt with that. And our records department ensured that everyone knew where they stood at the particular point in time. I think we were really successful using this model and getting our online training going. Once the model was in place, then we actually had to look at the content. And in terms of the content, the first stage for us was getting our instructors trained. There is, you have to actually have persons understanding the software one that they're going to use, recognizing what the pedagogical approaches needed to survive in an online environment were. So we went through a really long process of training our instructors in online delivery in assessment 
I'm looking at Microsoft Teams and the various features of Microsoft Teams that they could use. So they could use a quiz, they could use the discussion board, you know, different things. So, so even if they wanted to do collaborative work, how do you do collaborative work using Microsoft Teams? All of this was, would have been covered in our training sessions. Once we'd have gotten past that stage, then we really needed to get to the development. We recognize that it is important to have enough formative assessment built into your program once it's online. Because in the classroom environment, it may seem a little bit different, but in an online environment, persons could be present and not present. So it was really important to have that formative assessment there to see that students were participating and to give feedback, as well as the courseware that we developed, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't have much digital content, so a lot of that had to be put together at that stage two. Stage three involved the schedule, that planning schedule and that training schedule, and we did it in two weeks stints. So it would not have been too much at one point in time for any particular group of instructors to get done. So we pulled together every two weeks, they would put together a, a schedule of what was going to be delivered and when. As I mentioned before, we are planned to check out organization. So we monitored the delivery across all the campuses by every instructor. Each one of our classes has been recorded. And if it's not reviewed in lifetime, it's actually reviewed post the class. Again, we could not just jump in to blended delivery. So the first thing we would have did, we had to pilot a group. And in piloting that group, we looked at courses that would have been competed in the previous trimester. And we did a review classes for, the, for that particular group. That kind of gave us an uh, understanding of what the level of participation would be in those classes and gave us an opportunity to tweak some of the things that we were doing. Once that was settled, we moved into our second phase, which started in May, which was online delivery of our new content. So the newly designed content was put out, students were allowed now to come in and experience NESC's new blended style of delivery. And once that, is, that comes to an end, probably towards the end of August, we're then going to bring our students back in. As I said, we're preparing them for competence development. So as they come in, now they're going to actually get back into the workshops and do what they really came to do, which is to develop the skills and competence needed for the workforce. All that will come, culminate, of course, in our exams and competency, competency assessment going forward. As I mentioned, we did do a lot of surveys, we looked at our students and we wanted to make sure that our students were ready to participate. And these are just a few of the areas that we looked at. The first would have been the internet access of our students, and most students had home Wi-Fi. So that gave us the impetus to move forward. They also had the NESC account, but some of them had not yet accessed that account. So we had to get an idea of, okay, how many students can go online? And then we created the means by which they could actually access the training looked as well as what device would they use. And as I mentioned to you, everybody had a smartphone. So if you look down there, you'll see smartphone was the highest number of students had a smartphone that they would actually use to access the training. This influenced the kind of presentations that we would put in the, in the um, framework and in the delivery. We had to put um, delivery um, presentations that the students could actually view on their smartphone. If you look at the class time, everyone was, most students were free from nine to 12. Um, I don't know if, if that's just before lunch, so everybody was saying just before lunch, we're going to be okay. You know, just after breakfast, before lunch. So most students prefer the time from 9 to 12, but there were others who had different times that they wanted. And we had to be cognizant of the fact that students start, at least a lot of these students started working. So we moved classes around depending on the group of students that we had. Um, our heavy equipment program, for some reason, every student in heavy equipment was working. So the instructor, he moved his class time and he was actually delivering classes from eight to 10 every night, yeah? Once we would have gotten that first part done and got students in training, after the phase one, we wanted to get some feedback from our students in terms of how was the training going? Were you able to participate in that type of thing? And were you able to use Microsoft Teams? And most students agreed that they were. There were students with challenges and we worked towards addressing those challenges for those students. We looked at the time of our classes. We had to actually do synchronous teaching. It, it would have been better for us if we could have done asynchronous. However, based on the native students that we had, the inexperience of our students, we did not want to leave things to chance. So we wanted to cover everything that we could cover in a synchronous environment. However, 
the recordings of the sessions made it, made it made, um, the classes available for students to go back in and look at those classes afterwards. This is new for not just the faculty and the students, but everyone at the NESC. And we really wanted to find out how the students adjusted. And there were many students who had some challenges. And I said before, our student affairs department was able to connect with those students and see how they could, how they could help them adjust. Focusing class is also an issue. A lot of students would log in, they're there, they've logged in, but they're not necessarily there. So that we had to look at, we wanted to consider how do our students participate in class? What was their level of focus? This was a, a really tough road, getting everything done, but I'm really proud of the institution. I'm especially proud of the instructors, the faculty, the way they would have um, come together and created that learning, that learning community to get this job done. Over the period, 48 of our instructors were trained in online delivery and assessment methods. We, we commenced our online delivery within two weeks of stay at home. And I think that's phenomenal for the institution. We'd never done online delivery before. 707 of our students across eight programs in eight campuses were initiated for online training. They had access, the resources were there for them to log in and to participate in the training. This meant for us 5,384. Yes, we actually logged the number of online training hours that we've done from May to July across, and we've completed actually three courses in each other, three courses in each one of our programs, both year one and year two. We've seen a participation rate of 62%. It's a number that we really wanted closer to 100% and we're working with our students to get them online. We are one, we've monitored 100% of our online delivery courses. I keep saying NESC is a plan, do, check, act organization. So anything that we're gonna implement, we definitely want to make sure that we've done it, we've planned it, we've actually done what we say we're going to do, we monitor, and once we've gotten the evidence from the monitoring and the evaluation, we're gonna act on those changes that we need to make. How are we gonna move forward in this particular realm? Well, we have to look at our approach and check it, look at the effectiveness of our approach. Are there things that we can do differently? And I'm sure as we evaluate, we're gonna find things that we can change. We're working with RDC towards the continued development of our faculty and their competence in the virtual teaching and learning approaches. And we're now looking at our policies. How do we then redesign institutional policies, look at our quality guidelines and see how they can now support this new blended approach. We're seeking additional sources and I keep hearing open source mentioned a lot. Even though it says open source, it's a lot, it's quite challenging if you look at some of the programs that we do to access information in support of digital, pro of, of TVET programs online. It's not really that simple. If you look at a program like welding, um, mechanical maintenance, fabrication, in those contexts, a lot of the information is really geared towards engineering. So we, it, for us, it's a lot of building material, but we are open to open source information that is available. And of course, we will reinforce those professional learning communities within our organization. We will recognize the importance of learning communities, especially through this development phase and this implementation phase that we would have gone through. I think it's really important for all learning institutions, not just TVET, to develop those professional learning communities at their institution. At this point, I just want to invite um, Mr. Holt to come back in and give his closing comments. Uh, thanks, Kofi. I think you've, you've done a really excellent job in the last three months of uh, what I'd call a, you know, a, a, a disruptive uh, nature to move into an online environment. And uh, you know, we're really proud of the work that your team's done. We're really proud to continue to work with, with NESC on, on these challenges and share what we do here at Red Deer College. I think, you know, some of the closing thoughts that I have on your last slide here and, you know, some of the things that we're doing and we're seeing going forward is when we seek additional resources of online for online learning and the opportunities to infuse digital technology into the curriculum, um, there is a there's a really wide spectrum available content or resources that both learners and instructors can use. Um, it's our job as an institution to measure the quality of those online resources. Uh, we had an experience with one of our online programs uh, where we challenged students themselves to actually seek out content online and post and share the content that they have found that met a learning outcome. 
And you can imagine all the students have went to YouTube and, uh, you know, done a Google search and, and posted all of this content online. And uh, they did a really good job of it. But it was a great opportunity for the faculty member then to help them understand the why some of their examples were, were effective and on point and where some of them where the content uh, didn't actually meet the learning outcomes. And so it was an opportunity uh, to further the cognitive understanding of the students of the why behind the learning outcomes and help them assess good examples versus inappropriate examples. Um, I think the future of, of technical and vocational training is, is twofold. Online learning enables us to prepare and to maximize the time that the students will do in the shop or the, or the lab when they return to campus. Uh, working online helps us understand the why, it helps us understand the theoretical knowledge, and it gives us an opportunity to maximize our time and effort for that practical hands-on tool. Uh, I don't believe the future enables us to completely deliver technical and vocational training uh, in an online environment, but it does help us to create new models that maximizes the time the students have with their hands on the tools, their hands working in, in live practical applications. But most importantly, it helps us help the student have a better understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it. So that when they get to the employer, uh, they are a critical thinker, they're a problem solver, they're an effective communicator, and they have a passion for learning and a passion for seeking out new solutions. And uh, I think NESC is doing a great job of being a future and future ready leader in this model. And we're really proud to be their partner. Thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you, Mrs. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Tony, and talk, thank you, Mr. Hall, for those very informative presentations. We would have uh, gotten, firstly, an exposure to the open campus model for online training, and then we would have looked at an in-depth um, review of what is happening in the collaboration between the, the National Energy Skills Centre and Red Deer College in Alberta, Canada. So thank you so very much, sir to all our presenters. I am going to field as many questions as I can <laughs> in the time slot, so I'm going to move it around a, a bit. But I would want to start uh, with our last uh, um, co-presenters. Specifically, I would want to ask, Mr. direct my, quest, my first question to Mr. Holt. So one of our views, viewers uh, have asked, uh, um, uh, in light of this new COVID reality where some of the traditional face-to-face -face, uh, learning will now be happen, happening either as an online or blended approach. The question is, what can be said to industries or em employers uh, who may be concerned about uh, the level of uh, graduate that is now going to be coming out of that system and their, the learner's competence? And what techniques can perhaps uh, be borrowed from international best practice in terms of building the confidence of uh, our stakeholders in the industry to still have a, a sense that we are still providing the checks and balances as far as quality and sound assessment is concerned sure that's a really excellent question and i can share with you what we're doing here in canada so uh, that's a question that our industries and our employers here are asking of us uh, and what we've been able to show them is uh, here is the feedback that our learning management system is telling us about the students online experience, uh, particularly around the theoretical development of the competencies that they're learning. So our learning management system tells us the level of engagement that each learner has with the content. So it will tell us the amount of minutes that they have spent in the online environment, the number of times they've engaged with a specific learning content, the number of times they've re-watched a recorded uh, synchronous session. Uh, it will show us the feedback and engagement that they've had in discussion boards. Uh, it gives us a higher awareness of the, of the learning and the testing that we've put into there that helps the employer see a, a much larger engagement than we've ever been able to provide them in a face-to-face -face learning environment. Really, in a face-to-face -face learning environment, we tracked attendance, and we track their assessments. This allows us to actually record
record and demonstrate their engagement. The second part of it is we have still not replaced the hands-on uh, practical assessment tools. So while we're preparing a large portion of their, of their learning in an online environment, still here uh, through extensive risk assessments and campus mitigation plans, our students will still come back onto campus in very small cohorts, uh, respecting physical distancing and perform the practical assessments that we then add to the portfolio. So now we're gonna give an employer a portfolio that shows here's their engagement in the learning experience and the social learning platform, and here's their practical skills assessment. Um, and our new uh, software even allows us to digitally record some of those practical assessments and upload it into the LMS so that can be shown to employers as well. So they're not just getting a transcript, they're getting an actual e-portfolio that shows a much deeper understanding of the individual's candidate when it comes to employability. Thank you very much. Sounds good. So as you were speaking about uh, student engagement, I will throw my next question to Mr. Tony. Your participation rate after your pilot would have been 62%. Um, and in your assessment in terms of the preparedness and the willingness of students, we would have, yes, some candidates would have access to technologies, but some don't. So the question is, what has the NESC been, NESC has been doing to support those persons who are either on the fringe, you know, they are, they are featuring a bit, whether it's because of access or um, experience. So the, one of the first things we did is we reached out to most of our students. I think we've, we've been very close to 100, being able to contact close to 100% of our students to determine where they were in terms of ability to access our online training. Once we're able to do that, we then offered alternatives in terms of devices. So as I said before, we ensured that the content that they would have been exposed to would have been able to you could view the content on a, a cell phone. So any device, once you had a smartphone, you were actually able to access the content. All of our, all of our classes are recorded. So a student can actually access those classes beyond, not just at the time that they're being delivered, but after. So the student can go online to access those classes. Now we've also looked at there are students who, no matter what we would have been able to do, were unable to access those classes, access classes. As soon as we're given the ability to do so, our computer labs will become available through proper social distancing and through the guidelines that have been outlined by the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, we will allow those students to come in and sit and do those online classes at our campus once we are able to do so. We've not been given the okay to do that as yet, but it is an alternative that we're looking at in terms of students accessing training. Further to that, even if students come back only can come back in September, a lot of the content will be, they will go through some of that content again so that we can reinforce a number of the points that we would have made through the online classes. Uh, the, only, uh, the only challenge really is our ability to give the, those final exams that students have to access. But you will be able to come into the workshops, do the competent, competency training, and then access the, the, the theoretical content if you were unable to do so in the online environment. But we have um, gone to, to really extreme measures to get as many of our students online. Even though we're saying 62%, You'd be surprised that 62% is not the same students all the time. So we would have covered all of these students, but that average attendance and participation is at 62%. Okay, so my next question is, in the event that we have restrictions going well beyond September, is it that the, the campuses have a game plan for how students are actually going to access the workshops to do that practical assignments? It's really, really difficult to do competence development if you do not have access to the workshops. And I'm not sure that we can effectively um, give the train, do the training if students can't access the workshops. You will be able to cover the, the, the theoretical knowledge, yes. But access to the workshop, it was really what really drives that development of competence. And it's not as though the students could do these things at home because the equipment that you're going to need, um, the welding machines, the alignment machines, are not available for students just like that. So um, we will have to look at it if, if it goes beyond but in the interim, developing competence has to be done for us in the workshop. So Mr. Holt, uh, building on that question, one of our views, 
viewers are asking if uh, how accessible okay, how accessible are virtual simulations in T vector in your in your environment? Well, I, I would say depending on depending on the discipline you're speaking of, it, it, it's a it's a vast arraignment. Um, so you know, if you're thinking of if you look in the world of of electrician, uh, there are lots of augmented reality and virtual reality uh, simulations that can embed into a learning management system that allow a student to engage in VR content online for an electrician. Uh, and we use a lot of that in our electrical program that's very, very effective. And when they do come back to a campus in a safe environment, uh, we've seen through small pilots, uh, that transition of the AR and VR uh, training go right into the hands-on. Um, much different though for something like welding or fabricator uh, where you where where that's not that's not available however um, there is technology that's available that can be uh, loaned out to students or set up in environments where students can go to centers that are safe uh, where they can practice on our virtual reality and augmented reality welding systems um, that doesn't replace traditional welding but it does a really good job of helping them develop the fine motor skills the angle, the inclination, the travel speed, the, the rate, uh, setting their gas settings, setting up their welder system very well, so that when they do get back to the booth, the welding booth, they're what we're called booth ready. And we've done, for the last three years, we've done a lot of pilots, and we found when we've incorporated the VR and AR technology, which I'll show in a presentation on Thursday, um, the students transition to the booth much faster. They use less materials when they were in the actual booth, and they were more effective than uh, students who started in a traditional format. Thank you for that. Ms. Welch, we haven't forgotten you. <laughs> so I'm going to turn my, my next question to you. Um, in light of the conversation that would have been happening uh, with our last presenters in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, instructors are prepared for this new technology relevant uh, space where we are going to be using more blended and online uh, um, delivery and assessment. The question is, uh, are the courses, uh, are the courses at Open Campus geared towards instructor training, mindful of a competence-based education and training approach? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. We have incorporated a competency-based approach in our instruction for the online or blended learning teacher education program and in fact some of our partners are actually requesting it so yes we have to meet the demand that for competency-based training so how soon would we expect to see something being uh, uh, if i can put you on the spot i mean are there plans immediate near future long-term goals Oh no, uh, we have actually started to implement these training. So it's not something that is being planned. It's something that we have already started to implement. So as I had mentioned before, there are different uh, iterations of the training. So we customize training based on demand, but we do have competency-based instruction already developed and we would have implemented same. So in terms, you had mentioned at the start of your presentation that going online increased the access of students um, who normally may not have been able to be close to your campuses. Um, one viewer was curious to find out whether the profile of your um, students have changed, whether so beyond the geographic, have you seen more vulnerable and at risk cohorts coming into your program at Open Campus? We have seen uh, a shift to the younger uh, generation. So before we had a range between 25 year old to 50 year old. Now the majority, as I would have observed from some of the courses, um, the enrollment in some of the courses, there has been a shift to the age group 25 to 35 and even younger. So we have 18 year olds now enrolling in the um, courses being offered by the Oakland campus. Uh, we've always had 
you know, um, more females registering. So that has not changed really. Uh, we have more, more males uh, in recent times being involved in education and training. I think one of the uh, areas we need to strengthen is to include other persons. For example, the online environment can facilitate training of the disabled. And so we need to move more into that. But we have really pushed into developing some very specialized training, for example, for the uh, security and law enforcement industry, uh, the NGO management, uh, so and, and so on. So we do have a wide range of uh, stakeholders who have benefited from the training at the UA Open campus. So our last question for this afternoon, I'm going to be geared towards all three of you because we have the international perspective in Mr. Holt, the regional perspective with Ms. Welsh and Loka. So, this, so the comment is, adoption of technology generally requires a shifting in terms of the competencies that we will see in course designers and persons who handle assessment methods. Can you ex can you clarify what has have been the major issues faced in the designing of digital content and assessment for the regional perspective, international, and local? Everything in one. So, Ms. Ms. Welsh, can you start? Just to clarify your question, you're asking um, what challenges have we experienced in implementing in, training? Yes, in, yes, in creating digital digital content for your environment. Well, specific to TVET, of course, there is the financial element because, as would have alluded to earlier, it does require some sort of software simulation, the AR, VR technology. So uh, it, is, it does cost to implement uh, these emerging technologies. And so we have been having a challenge trying to access that. Notwithstanding that, we have had some uh, experience using uh, to a certain extent some of these new and emerging technologies but if you're looking at rolling out on a larger scale in the region we would hope that we will have more involvement of the governments in the region in assisting the TVET uh, programs to be rolled out on a, on a wider scale basis so that they can involve more practical elements insofar as it relates to persons who do not necessarily have access to a physical facility and would have to come in to uh, or access on their mobile phones uh, you know it would require certain uh, equipment additional equipment so it, it, it does require uh, that financial assistance which we don't, we don't necessarily have that at the moment and so perhaps this could be a call for the governments of the region to look at assisting us in um, being more proactive in the approach in rolling out uh, TVET at the higher education level. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Uh, really great question, and, and Ms. Walsh, that's a that's a phenomenal response from an international perspective. And our our challenges here. You know, you, we've got some phenomenal learning designers who have spent years preparing for the future of, of training. And they're really good at being creative and innovative to design online learning and, and blended learning programs for competency-based education. Where the challenge comes in is when we now engage instructors who went through their own learning experience of this is how I learned to be competent in this, in this area. This is how I was taught. And so this is the only way that I think this can be taught. And you get this paradox where they say, this is the only way you can train a welder. There's no way you can train a welder in an online way. And they'll tell you that. And you have to go through a, uh, a process of shifting their mindset. And so not only do you have a mindset shift from a learning design perspective, but you have a mindset shift from an instructor delivery perspective. And it's really hard to change tradition really, really hard. Uh, fortunately, this is probably the only good thing that's come out of COVID-19, is that it has forced us to change our mindset. 
Uh, we no longer have a choice to wait. Uh, we have to change in order to be uh, viable and sustainable in the future. And so I think, you know, from an international perspective, it's uh, the tools are there, the ability to create an online uh, competency-based education is there. It's the willingness for the institution and our subject matter experts to adopt. And as Ms. Welsh said, the willingness of government to make resources available for institutions uh, to be able to onboard this and uh, take the risks and be willing to fail and fail forward. So not every initiative is going to work. And so in, in an environment with razor thin budgets and low risk tolerance, we have to be willing to try things and then pull forward the learning experience and crawl, walk, run into this new environment. Thank you. And I get to answer that. Yes. And last but not least. <laughs> and, um, first of all, the finance, yes, definitely. And I'm, and I'm also agreeing with Rod in terms of instructors and their unwillingness to adapt and adopt to the technology. But it's also about the students as well. The students, we need students who, who are coming into some of these institutions digital already. Uh, many of the students that come in are really in a place where they're not familiar with technology at all. And it's important through our school systems as well that we have students who are coming through our systems, primary, secondary schools, digital ready, especially those that are going to go into TBET. So those are the most at-risk students, of course, the students who, are, who do not have access and are unable to then understand the technology. Because while you may design a particular software that will for VR or AR, the students who are coming in have to be able to use that technology and understand how to use that technology. So I think one of the things that we also have to look at is our students are not necessarily coming to us digitally, and we have to look at that as well. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your contribution and your responses this afternoon and your patience with us for the little delayed start that we had this afternoon. So my viewing audience, we have come to the end of uh, the very first day of the National Training Agency's ETVET convention. And we hope that you have gleaned some knowledge, some insight, some perspective that you will sit with and marinate on and perhaps push the margin to continue to explore ways in which we are compelled to evolve in this new reality. I'm going to invite you to join us tomorrow and log on once again so that we can... Uh... What's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is this way. <laughs> right, so yes, they are prompting me to remind you to Thursday for, and I keep saying tomorrow, my apologies, on Thursday for our second day of the convention. And we look forward to seeing all of us here once more. So, on this note, I want to say thank you so very much for your engagement and your participation because without you, we would not have been able to pull this off. And I want you to have a productive afternoon, a restful night. Be safe and be blessed, my friends. Good afternoon. Today's segment is sponsored by the MIC Institute of Technology, Training for Industry, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and Trico Clinic, Hair and Scalp Solutions.